right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'd like to call this meeting of the City of Santa Cruz Planning Commission to order. Tess, can we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Conway? Here. Dawson? Here. Gordon? Here. Maxwell? McKelvey? Here. Paul Hamas? Here. Chair Kennedy? Here. And, uh, Commissioner Maxwell is absent with notice. Do we have any statements of disqualification amongst the commissioners tonight? Seeing none, we'll move on to oral communications. Uh, oral communications is a time to come address us on anything not on the agenda tonight. So if you'd like to speak to the agenda item, hold on for just a minute. We'll get there soon enough. Um, line up over here. We'll do a two-minute limit for oral communications. And come on up. Thanks for uh, coming, and we want to hear what you have to say. Uh, hi, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Frank Barron. Um, I wanted to uh, have an inquiry to staff about um, an item that's not on the agenda. Um, there was a, <clears throat> um, an article in the, um, the Lookout publication um, today, um, and I wanted to get some clarification about uh, height limits for fences. If a landowner wanted to build a seven-foot fence, what would be the process? Would it, is that something that is, is typically granted? Uh, that's one of my questions. The other one is regarding ADUs, accessory dwelling units. If a um, landowner wanted to do, um, say, 18 inches higher than what is typically allowed, um, would that be something that um, could uh, they could get an exception for? Um, those are two questions I'd like to have um, answers to. Okay. Do you want to leave your information here for uh, staff and they can follow up with you? Okay. Next. Uh, hello, my name is Susan Monheit, and I have a couple of questions, uh, follow-up questions from Frank. I'm, I'm really disappointed that there is no staff available at this meeting who could simply answer those very simple questions now. I can, I can answer them. Uh, a, a variance would be needed for both of those situations. And, and is our variances routinely granted? Is it? An, rare exception or is that is there precedent for um allowing variances or i don't know if you want to leave your your info okay. so i out. have a question about building height and um i'd like to know if um the application of the density bon density bonus law uh qualifies as you know uh a waiver to the zoning height limit which is being done all over town because the developers have that entitlement to do that. So are, are those waivers to the general plan zoning height limits? Can anyone answer that here? Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering, Chair, could we just have staff just answer it's some like yes kind no. of the basic yeah, sure, questions. I just didn't yeah. set up a kind of no, I mean, I think they're just asking some very big, like, yeah. do variances happen is the question. Yeah, happy to answer all those questions. Um, fence height, uh, the answer is it depends. It depends on where it is. If it's in the front yard setback, it's a three and a half foot height limit. If it's behind the front yard setback, it's six feet off the top of my head. There is a process for uh, a conditional fence permit to go above those heights. And depending on what it is, it may require hearing, it may not. To go above height for an accessory dwelling unit would require a variance. Uh, the, the findings for approval of a variance are fairly onerous. Uh, it requires uh, that there some, be some kind of special circumstance that's physical and associated with the property. We don't grant those very readily because the standard is so high. Mm -hmm. With respect to your question regarding density bonus, there can be a height waivers or exceptions that are granted in conjunction with the uh, project uh, so long as they have the requisite number of affordable units included in the project. Okay. And, and concessions fall into that? Yep. So, Hold on. Mm -hmm. uh, Eric, is there still an allowance if there is a, uh, a desire to meet architectural style for roof height? 
Uh, yes, there are some height. So if, there if the are roof certain slopes, height exceptions mm -hmm. for, for architectural purposes yeah. and other uh, features that are associated with the building. Uh, and one last very quick question. Would any of those circumstances cause a general plan amendment for rezoning? Not those circumstances that I responded to this evening. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right, any other oral communications on items not on the agenda tonight? Going once, going twice. Uh, seeing none, I'd like to open the public hearing for the appeal. Oop. Minutes. Oh, your minutes, thank you. Uh, can we get a motion to approve the minutes of November 2nd and November 16th, please? I'll move both items, or single item, both minutes. I can second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Now I will open the public hearing for the appeal on the 900 High Street project. Uh, staff, can we have a presentation, please? Yeah, good evening, Chair Kennedy, members of the commission. I'd like to introduce uh, Brittany Whitehill, um, who's the project planner for this. She's new to the city since uh, June of this year, um, and she comes to us from the city of Mountain View. And so she'll be giving you her first presentation uh, this evening. Um, also uh, in attendance from staff, uh, since there are some transportation related issues, is Matt Starkey from Public Works, in case you have any questions around that. So I'll turn it over to Brittany. Uh, good evening, commissioners, and it's uh, great to meet you and um, welcome members of the public. The item for your consideration this evening is an appeal of the zoning administrator's acknowledgement of the environmental determination and approval of the minor land division, design permit, slope development permit, density bonus request, and heritage tree removal permit to divide a parcel into two lots and construct a 40 unit four story building within 20 feet of a 30% slope and to remove 14 heritage trees on a site with an existing church located at 900 High Street in the R110 zone district. The project site is a 5.9 acre lot located on the north side of High Street, immediately northeast of its intersection with Moore Street. The site is surrounded by UCSE campus housing to the north, a quarry, single family homes and city owned land and a church to the east, single family homes across High Street to the south and Westlake Elementary School to the west. And the property has existed with a church that hosts a preschool and a dwelling unit. In November of 2022, the city received an application proposing a 40 unit, four story apartment building on the church campus. The project proposes to split the parcel into two lots, a lower 3.9 acre lot that will retain the church campus and an upper two acre flag lot with the apartment. The project proposes to remove 14 heritage trees either due to their condition or due to conflicts with the development footprint. The project proposes to provide five low income units and four very low income units amounting to 22.5 of the total 40 units. This level of affordability exceeds the 10% minimum lower income threshold to qualify for density bonus. Additionally, this level of affordability exceeds the minimum 20% inclusionary requirements of the city code. The density bonus request does not include a request for additional density bonus units, but does request concessions from two development standards and a waiver from one development standard. The concession requests include a reduced front setback, and this is from the interior lot line, um, of approximately 17.5 feet as opposed to the minimum 20 foot setback. Secondly, a concession is requested for increased building height of four stories and up to 54 feet at the tallest point of the building, where the maximum height allowed in the zone district is two and a half stories and 30 feet. And both concession requests aim to reduce the overall grading and construction costs of the project to enable the provision of the affordable units. The applicant is requesting one waiver to place the trash enclosure within the front setback of lot one, and this is the only possible location for the trash enclosure that complies with public works refuse standards and that avoids constraints such as the steep slopes, heritage trees. Both the building and trash enclosure will be set back over 250 feet from High Street. 
The project is also subject to the provisions of California Senate Bill 330, which amended the Housing Accountability Act in 2020, aiming to maximize and streamline the production of housing throughout the state. The applicant submitted a pre-application for this project in 2022, and the pre-application was deemed complete on January 11th, 2023 for consistency with the pre-application submittal requirements of SB 330. As a result, the project is locked into all standards and policies that were in place at the time the pre-application was deemed complete, and the project is not subject to the city's new objective standards for multifamily development. So the zoning administrator heard this item on October 4th, 2023. 15 members of the public spoke at the meeting. Eight public comments were generally supportive of the project, citing the project's contributions towards the city's housing supply. Seven public comments opposed the project, citing concerns with vehicle congestion, traffic safety impacts, tree removal, and neighborhood compatibility. On October 15th, 2023, Deborah Elston, representing the Westlake Neighborhood Association, filed an appeal of the zoning administrator's approval of the project. Since the appeal was filed, 118 additional pieces of written correspondence have been received, 74 supporting the project and 44 opposing it. The following provides an overview of the concerns raised in the appellant's letter and a summary of staff's responses. However, this presentation is not intended to provide an exhaustive review of all items raised in the appeal. In-depth responses to the appellant's points are included in the Planning Commission agenda report. And additionally, the appeal letter was, an, was included as an attachment. And as just a point of clarification, um, I'd like to highlight that a lot of comments reference the project having 59 units, however, it is 40 units. The project site has a zoning designation of R110 and a general plan designation of low density residential, both of which allow primarily for single family residential uses. Understandably, the appeal raised questions as to how the 40 unit apartment complex could be allowed on site. SB 330 identifies the general plan as superseding any inconsistent zoning designation and requires an agency to permit residential development on a particular site at the density allowed under the general plan. While the zone district does not provide for multifamily development, the project site is 5.9 acres in size and the general plan land use designation allows for a base residential density of 59 units. The project proposes 40 units, which is within the allowed density range. A prohibition of multifamily development on the site would preclude development at the allowed density under the general plan and be inconsistent with the Housing Accountability Act. General plan policies support clustering of residential development with units closer together or attached to respond to a site's topography, environmental constraints, or adjacent uses. The project will retain the existing church and ancillary uses on site, and the site is constrained by heritage trees and a steep slope that limits access to the upper portion. Um, considering these constraints, the general plan policies um, about supporting residential or rather clustering residential density um, support the practice of clustering on this site. To ensure future development does not exceed the density ranges of the general plan, a condition of approval requires a deed restriction to be recorded on both new lots to limit the overall site base density to the maximum allowed under the general plan. And this practice of clustering residential density was recently litigated on a project at 126 Eucalyptus Street, um, and the courts did rule in favor of the city's practice of clustering residential density. Another concern raised in the appeal pertains to traffic safety near Westlake Elementary School. The church and ancillary uses at 900 High Street are currently serviced by a driveway that circumnavigates the site in a counterclockwise direction providing ingress at the eastern edge of the site and egress at the western edge adjacent to Westlake Elementary, as is shown on the slide. The appeal letter raised concerns about existing on-site traffic hazards from cars exiting the site and turning right westbound onto High Street, and that additional traffic generated by the project would worsen existing conditions and potentially create additional safety hazards at the intersection of High and Moore, especially during the Westlake Elementary pickup and drop-off hours. 
The appellant did request uh, traffic accident and ticketing data for the intersection of High Street and Moore Street. Police records indicate that two traffic accidents and 18 traffic stops have occurred at this intersection within the last year, and police have indicated that this is not unusually high for an intersection of this scale. During review of the project, the City Public Works Department identified that the on-site circulation could be improved due to the proximity of the egress driveway to the driveway for Westlake Elementary. Um, the applicants worked with Public Works staff to re-navigate on-site traffic by designating the West Driveway next to Westlake as a right turn only, entrance only driveway. As a result, the primary ingress and egress will be provided to, uh, from the east driveway, which is located further away from Westlake Elementary. Signage will be placed on site to deter residents and visitors from turning left across High Street onto the west driveway. Members of the public have requested that a barrier be placed in the middle of High Street to prevent vehicles from turning left into the west driveway, and Public Works staff have considered this request and ultimately determined it could create an additional traffic safety hazard. Additionally, the West Driveway will provide emergency vehicle and trash collection access, so it needs to be accessible from both directions. The appellant made various claims related to the methodologies used to analyze vehicle miles traveled, VMT and level of service, LOS impacts of the project, which are discussed in the next couple of slides. In 2013, the state passed Senate Bill 743, or SB 743, which altered how transportation impacts from new developments are measured under CEQA. Prior to SB 743, transportation impacts were assessed in terms of level of service, a measure of automobile delays along a roadway. While LOS was um, the default metric for determining transportation impacts for many years, LOS is an automobile-centric metric that does not support statewide sustainability goals and therefore can no longer be used as part of a project CEQA analysis. In June 2020, the City Council adopted VMT guidelines that established a VMT threshold as the new transportation metric to determine CEQA impacts and established that certain projects can be assumed to have a non-significant impact or screen out based on their location and characteristics. As part of the required CEQA, CEQA review for the project, a project-specific VMT analysis was conducted, and the project was determined to meet two screening criteria of the city VMT guidelines, resulting in no significant impact. And a detailed discussion of this can be found in the attachment called Statutory Exemption Checklist. So while LOS is no longer a valid metric for analyzing environmental impacts under CEQA, agencies may continue to to implement LOS-focused policies outside of the CEQA process. The Santa Cruz General Plan does include several aspirational LOS-related policies, and city staff strives to implement these policies through development review to the extent that they do not conflict with VMT-related policies of the General Plan or violate the requirements of SB 743. Staff also relies on project-specific LOS analysis to identify key locations where traffic infrastructure improvements could improve LOS. The city requires a traffic impact study, or a TIS, to be prepared for any project that is estimated to generate more than 50 vehicle trips during the PM peak hour. Um, projects that are, that are uh, generating fewer than 50 p.m. peak hour trips are exempt from this requirement, but typically required to pay a traffic impact fee, which is used to fund tr uh, city transportation-related capital improvements projects. A trip generation memo was prepared for the project and estimated the apartment complex would generate between 20 and 26 p.m. peak hour trips, which is well below the 50 p.m. peak hour trip threshold, so a traffic impact study was not required to be prepared. The VMT, or I apologize, the appeal letter made various claims about the legitimacy and ad adequacy of both the VMT and LOS analyses that were conducted for this project. However, VMT analysis was conducted in accordance with the requirements of the city's guidelines and the California Environmental Quality Act. The project was reviewed for traffic safety and consistency with LOS-related policies of the general plan. Consequently, the on-site circulation plan was improved and the project will pay a traffic impact fee. 
Uh, so touching on some general plan policies, the appeal asserts that the project violates several uh, transportation and traffic related general plan policies, including those shown on the screen. Staff's assessment, however, is that the project in fact supports these policies. Regarding LU 4.2, the project site is located within a half mile walking distance of several community serving uses, including UCSC, Westlake Elementary, Westlake Park, several churches, and a small strip mall, including a convenience store and laundromat. Additionally, the site is located approximately one mile from Mission Street and surrounding streets, which provide access to numerous commercial uses. And the site is located within a half mile of several major transit stops. Regarding M1 2.2, the city will continue to implement the capital improvements program, which includes two approved transportation related infrastructure projects in the vicinity and traffic impact fees collected by projects such as this one will be used to help fund those, um, those CIPs. Regarding M3.2, as previously described, the project was reviewed by traffic and transportation engineering staff of the Public Works Department. In response to the traffic and transportation review, the circulation plan was modified to reduce potential hazards. The appeal expresses concerns that the project violates general plan policies related to congestion management, LOS, and reduction of cut through traffic on neighborhood streets. The 2030 general plan EIR studied citywide roadway capacity and identified two impacted intersections near the project site. And the project is expected to result in marginal increases in traffic but the project size would be within the potential build out of the general plan and thus within the scope of the traffic analyses conducted for the EIR and would not result in any new significant or more severe significant impact. Lastly, regarding traffic impacts, the appellant claims that the traffic on High Street during afternoon hours greatly impacts mental health of neighbors. The Housing Accountability Act strictly limits the city's ability to deny a residential project or reduce its density when said project is consistent with the city's objective standards. To do so, the city would need to find that the project creates a significant, quantifiable, direct and unavoidable impact based on objective identified written public health and safety standards, policies or conditions as they existed on the date the application was deemed complete. And while there may be impacted intersections and at times significant traffic in the project vicinity, there is no evidence to suggest that the marginal additions to traffic generated by this project would result in a significant quantifiable direct and unavoidable impact. The appeal raised concerns that the on-site parking provided is insufficient to accommodate the uses. Effective January 1st of this year, AB 2097 eliminated all parking requirements for the site within a half mile of an existing or planned major transit stop. And this was codified into the city code in April 2023. The entire site is located within a half mile of several major transit stops and therefore parking is not required. The project is voluntarily proposing 20 parking spaces on lot one and retaining 97 spaces on lot two. Historically, Peace United has rented facilities to the community for various events, and the appellant has raised concerns as to how parking for these events will be managed. Peace United has specified that most events are small, such as meetings, for which the existing parking supply is sufficient. Periodically, Peace United will host or rent facilities for larger events, such as weddings, memorial services, and special holiday church services. The city has not received complaints regarding any event in the past. Peace United has also indicated that they will evaluate on-site parking needs and impacts when considering future events. If um, ever a significant event beyond the scope of what would typically be allowed on the site were proposed, a five-day use permit would need to be obtained. Um, and at that time, possible impacts of the event would be evaluated. However, the city's ability to regulate parking on-site would remain limited under state law. And really quickly regarding bike parking, um, the project would be required to provide 53 bike parking stalls and has opted to provide 96 and the provision of abundant bike parking is aligned with several general plan policies. The project proposes removal of 14 heritage trees, six that are in poor condition and eight that are within the project footprint. The project arborist evaluated whether an alternative building location would enable preservation of additional heritage trees. However, due to various constraints, including 
required setbacks from highly sloped areas of the site and the quarry to the east, a feasible alternative building placement that resulted in a greater degree of, of heritage tree preservation was not identified. Um, a condition of approval requires each heritage tree to be removed, um, be replaced by either one 24 inch size tree or three 15 gallon trees, which is consistent with the city's adopted mitigation policies. Um, and the city arborist did evaluate the proposed removal and mitigation and concurs with these recommendations. The appeal raised concerns about the proposed heritage tree removal, citing possible wind and noise impacts and soil instability concerns. Staff found inconclusive research to support the idea that trees can be planted in a manner to provide wind buffering. However, the city has no adopted policy requiring trees to be planted or maintained in this way. Um, the research surrounding the efficacy of trees as noise buffers is also inconclusive. Importantly, the California Supreme Court recently made a decision regarding a high profile case in Berkeley that centered around noise impacts generated from a housing development. The courts found that noise impacts generated by people residing at a housing development cannot be viewed as a significant environment, environmental impact under CEQA. Soon after, Assembly Bill 1307, which echoes the court's decision, was passed by the State Assembly and signed into law. And regarding soil instability, most research surrounding the potential erosion impacts of tree removal stems from uh, the clear cutting of many trees. And the tree removal proposed on site is selective. Therefore, this um, research about clear cutting trees is not applicable. The plant palette is also proposing a net increase to the number of trees that would mitigate any potential erosion impacts. And additionally, extensive geotechnical analysis has occurred and the project will be required to implement the recommendations of the geotechnical engineer. The appeal also cited concerns with impacts to public views, asserting that vistas from the residences on Hagar Court, which is located uphill of the project site, will be impacted and that the project violates general plan policies related to protection of public views and open spaces. Regarding policy CD 1.2, the general plan EIR identifies specific significant views and features in the city as is shown on this slide. Um, furthermore, er, as, as you can see shown in this slide, um, the project site is this red arrow. It, it would not impact any identified significant view um, within the city's general plan EIR. Um, the points close to the project site where the coast may be viewable are likely uphill from Hagar Court, and these public vantage points are already obstructed by existing buildings on private properties. Regarding CD 1.4, although a large portion of the site is not currently developed and is in a natural state, the project is not adjacent to any designated open space, therefore this policy is not applicable. And lastly, regarding CD 2.1, the site is not located within a historic district or within an area plan that seeks to preserve an established architectural style. And additionally, the Housing Accountability Act prohibits agencies from requiring projects to comply with standards that are not objective, quantifiable, written development standards. The subjective nature of CD 2.1 precludes the city from using it to deny or reduce density of a housing project unless those specific public health and safety findings can be made. So the appellant claims that preliminary geotechnical analysis on the site may have resulted in a murky appearance of Westlake Pond. The geotechnical analysis performed at the site is typical of pre-construction geotechnical analysis and reflects the industry best practice standards. The appellant did not provide evidence or rationale as to how the borings could have resulted in the changes to the appearance of Westlake Pond, which is located approximately 750 feet from the project site. The project's geotechnical engineer provided a letter summarizing the geotechnical investigation that has occurred to date and confirming that no ground, groundwater has been encountered. The appellate states that tribal resources, including burials and artifacts, have been identified during other construction projects in the vicinity and notes that the project is located within a highly sensitive archaeological area. The appellant states that an oversight person should be present on site, presumably during construction activities. The site is located within areas in the general plan that are mapped as sensitive and highly sensitive for archaeological resources. And Albion Environmental prepared an initial archaeological investigation 
and subsequent extended phase one study. These studies did not indicate the presence of any intact resource and recommended that the applicant notify the appropriate authorities should earth moving work result in the discovery of an intact resource. And this recommendation is consistent with the city standard condition of approval that's included for this project. Lastly, I'll highlight some construction related concerns raised by the appellant. Um, the appeal submitted initially included a letter from Coastal Community Preschool, which is the preschool currently operating on the site. The letter raised a variety of concerns, including potential noise and emissions impacts to the preschool. Um, on November 7th of this year, staff received a follow-up email from the preschool administration indicating that the concerns expressed in their original letter have been addressed through coordination with the property owner, Peace United Church of Christ, and both parties have indicated that they will um, work in coordination as the project progresses. Additionally, the appellant has requested that construction vehicles utilize Bay Drive as opposed to High Street to access the site. Uh, public work staff concur that the use of Bay Drive would likely be less impactful to neighborhood. Um, to address the concerns raised by the appellant and Coastal Community Preschool, staff's recommended conditions of approval include three new conditions of approval. Apologies there. Um, one requiring the, uh, the applicant to provide a construction access and management plan prior to building permit issuance. One requiring that stationary construction equipment meet specified emission standards, and one requiring a neighbor liaison contact to be identified and contact information to be posted on site to field any construction concerns or questions. And these are included as conditions number 45, 46, and 47. And as a final point, I would like to thank uh, Commissioner Dawson for her suggestion regarding maintaining access to the rear lot one, which will include the apartment. A portion of the driveway providing access to lot one does cross onto lot two, and this will be addressed by an ingress and egress easement on the site. However, for additional clarity, staff is proposing a new condition 56 that is shown on the screen to um, formally memorialize within the conditions that lot one needs to be maintained as accessible. The appellant has expressed their desire for a less dense project. However, staff would like to highlight the city's legal obligations under the Housing Accountability Act. The city cannot deny a housing project or reduce its density, FAR, or unit count if the project is consistent with objective standards that were in effect at the time the application was deemed complete, unless the city makes written findings that, that the project would have a specific adverse impact upon public health and safety. Ultimately, the appeal provided no evidence to support these findings, and the assertions presented are generally unsubstantiated, factually inaccurate, or irrelevant to the project. Additionally, the appellant and several public comments have recently requested a pause on the project. It is important to note that SB 330 also establishes a five public hearing maximum for housing projects, and continuing this item to a future meeting would constitute an additional meeting for the purpose of this five meeting limit. The Permit Streamlining Act also requires an agency to act on a project within 60 days of the determination that the project is exempt from CEQA, which was achieved at the October 4th Zoning Administrator meeting. When the Zoning Administrator decision is appealed, the City Code requires the Planning Commission to hear the meeting at the soonest available, or hear the item at the soonest available meeting. Staff continues to support the project as designed and with the conditions approved by the zoning administrator with the addition of the three new construction related conditions previously discussed um, and the new condition number 56 that was shown on the previous slide. The project is consistent with the general plan and meets all applicable required objective site development standards except as modified by state density bonus waivers and concessions. The number of affordable units exceeds the density bonus and inclusionary housing requirements. Therefore, staff recommends that the Planning Commission deny the appeal, upholding the Zoning Administrator's approval of the Minor Land Division Design Permit, Slope Development Permit, Density Bonus Request, Heritage Tree Removal Permit, based on the findings and conditions found in the agenda report with the addition of the new condition number 56 shown on the previous slide, and the formal recommendation language is shown on the screen. Um, thank you, and we're happy to address any questions, and I believe the appellant has submitted a video testimony. All right, thank you for that report. Um, I know I've got one question. Do other commissioners have questions? 
Commissioner McKelvey? As far as the archaeological uh, resources assessment goes, they did a rec surface reconnaissance and then a phase one study, you said? That's correct. And was there any um, reason not to have an observer during excavation? So typically we would require, we would rely heavily on the recommendations of the archaeologist. Um, if they had discovered an intact resource during their initial investigations, then we would definitely require an on-site monitor, or if there was some other reason, something unusual that they had discovered and, and made that recommendation, we would require it. I just know that in, I myself have had experience with projects where observers were required even when there wasn't any observed artifacts, um, intact or otherwise, and I'm just curious as to how this compares with the typical practice. Yeah, it's, it's typically a kind of a two-step process for the archaeologists. First, they uh, get in contact with Sonoma State University, which is sort of the regional clearinghouse for uh, archaeological studies and reporting. So they look at what's been recorded in proximity, and then they do their surface reconnaissance and then make their recommendations after you know, getting the results of those two exercises. I'll note that um, a couple of years ago, we uh, just did a major overhaul or a review of our archaeological maps and updated them based on all the, the various studies that have occurred since General Plan 2030 was adopted about 10 years ago. So those those maps are up to date, so I'm sure that played into the conclusion okay. as well. But that's been investigated in terms of the need for an observer versus... Right, it's, it's, it's their just, professional recommendation. Right. Yeah, and then, you know, as sort of another layer of protection, we have a standard condition of approval that basically... Um, requires the applicant to stop work if an un unanticipated resource is found during construction, and that happens from time to time. Okay. So. Thank you. Very good question. I'm always surprised by the experience up here. And Tim Murray, did you have one? Okay. I wanted to return just back to the, the allowable residential density on the acres. I think I got it. But the... 5.9 acres gets split into 3.9, and then that allows 10 dent DU per acre on the 3.9 acre parcel? So the 3.9 acre parcel will actually retain the church. So the development is oh, proposed on the... Got it. <laughs> yeah, and there's policies in the general plan that essentially would allow for a, a project to be subdivided and the residential got density it. to be consolidated on one lot. Um, and to prevent a, a situation in the future where, you know, then someone comes, you know, essentially we've transferred that development right to lot one. So that will be memorialized through a, a recorded document on both properties. Okay, that makes sense. I just switched them in my mind, which is my confusion. Uh, tra traffic studies, traffic studies, VMT, one more question. Um, I think the VMT thing is great. So it, it, it indicated like in the worst case peak PM hour, the trip would generate less than 30 trips? Correct. Okay, and there's 40 units, so that would be like three quarters of the people in that building, assuming one car per unit, all leaving within an hour. Okay, I, I just like to kind of like put those into reality because it sounds like a lot, but 30 trips an hour, meh. Okay, uh, other questions? All right, so in this case, we will next hear from the appellant. And uh, Ms. Deborah Elston submitted some comments on video. They're about 11 minutes long. So we're gonna watch that. And then the appellant has nine more minutes in their 20 minutes if you wanna add anything. I understand there's other representatives here. Um, then after about 20 minutes, we'll close that presentation. Hello. Planning Commissioners, I'm really sorry as the appellant that I cannot attend this evening's meeting as I have previous commitments that could not be changed. I requested that staff change to a later date and when it was set for November 30th, I was told that it could not accommodate a later date. So here I am. I would like to elaborate on some of my points raised in the appeal. Some of them are very critical to the effects of the project in our neighborhood. 
Our main concerns are safety, geologic procedures, land use, traffic, parking, and the inconsistency of the project with zoning and adjacent properties. I will only bring up a few critical points as neighbors will be able to provide more details on other points of our neighborhood appeal. Regarding our point number seven, related to the zoning of the church property and our neighborhood, the project numbers are being rearranged in a way that is not supported by the general plan or the municipal code. The project site is being divided into two parcels, one that is already developed with a church and the other two acre portion that is undeveloped. This results in essentially doubling the density of the site because the proposal includes transferring residential density from an already developed property to an underdeveloped parcel. Legally speaking, there is no authority to transfer density of housing that would be permitted on the resulting developed parcel to the other undeveloped parcel of two acres. The resulting developed parcel already has an established land use that has existed for 64 years and is built for and operated as a church. If the church wants to demolish its development and build housing in its place, it could do so. But there is no authority to transfer development from a developed parcel to a undeveloped parcel to increase density of the undeveloped parcel. Moreover, the general plan and the zoning ordinance are not consistent as the staff report states. Page 144 of the general plan LU 3.7.1 allow and encourage development that meets the high end of the general plan use designation density and less constraints associated with the site characteristics and zoning development standards require a lower density. The zoning is consistent with the range of densities allowed in the general plan, and this project actually does not conform to the general plan. Since the zoning standards are less than the maximum permitted under the general plan designation, but within the range permitted under the general plan designation, the zoning development standard is R1-10, and the project far exceeds the standard. There seems to be some flaws and conflicts in the planning analysis process. The following are brief, just noted items. Number two on the appeal, page 2.3 analysis regarding stormwater runoff and rivers down High Street. The analysis stating, stated that the public works staff confirmed there is no known flooding on High Street. I guess I've lived with this for so long it has become the norm, as well as all the other neighbors. Flooding happens on a regular basis at Spring and High, Laurent and High Streets, and a river does go down High Street. In fact, several years ago, there were sandbags placed on the street in front of a home, which eventually did get flooded out. Even the bike lane on High Street can be compromised with the river and rocks from the hill on a regular basis. Rewording the appeal points resulted in changing meaning or completely missing the point of an appeal item. Number six, appeal, page 2.6 analysis, using the vehicle miles traveled. While preferred at, as a state standard, it does not adequately cover the true reality of the traffic picture. The baseline VMT reflects, quote, regional average per capita and is based on units. Many units have multiple bedrooms, in one case, five bedrooms. Units don't drive cars, people do. Analysis states potential number of residents is not an input used to determine a project's eligibility to screen out BMT impacts. This may be true, a rule to follow, but it hides the actual use of vehicles and burdens on the environment. This also doesn't include the reality of traffic generated by Westlake School or UCSC. Let's use VMT on Westlake School and UCSC. 
This project cannot stand alone without looking at a cumulative aspects of other properties. I also would like to note that once people live in the neighborhood, they will quickly learn they cannot use High Street and will use other neighborhood streets to get off the hill. At the very least, a level of service should be studied to figure out what relief can be used to alleviate the already burdened street and ensure safety for all users. When the bucket of water is full, it will eventually overflow. Level of service can be used in specific circumstances. Number eight of the appeal, page 2.11, questions the number of people living at the property. The church believes that there maybe would be 100 people. We believe it could be up to 150. Applying restrictions on the number of occupants who can inhabit a unit can be argued as violations of the Fair Housing Act. Even though they are encouraging no cars, the reality is more people, more cars, traffic, and parking. Number 10 of the appeal, page 2.13, questions on social events and guest parking. The planning department reply was simply stated that no complaints regarding the in past events, probably because there was parking available. Now they will have people living on the property and taking up spaces. The church stated they have agreements with Westlake School for parking, but that's not very much parking. Number 11 of the appeal and page 2.13 regarding VISTAs, CD 1.2 in the general plan to use High Street when looking up the hill, you're absolutely right. You will not see this project because you're looking uphill. But to state it is not seen from surrounding properties is completely incorrect. One point of view, Westlake Park, Bradley and Spring Streets, it will be a significant view. Number 19 appeal 2.16 analysis in summation regarding children's safety with all traffic, a policeman was requested by the school to be there. Quote, we're asking to report on ticketing and accidents. In the planning analysis, it states that the appellate claims that a police officer will be required to be stationed, end quote, at that location. In my 23 years of neighborhood work and volunteering with the police department, I would never make this statement. I know it is not possible to have an officer sitting on a street when they have numerous calls for service to answer. Number 22 appeal, page 2.17. Street parking permit program. The city staff does not recommend deviating from established permit program, meaning that one person may park three blocks from their residence. Westlake neighborhood already has a permit program. And the reason why was because the students were doing parking their cars for a week on the street. Now I'm wondering why we have a permit program if neighbors from three blocks away and get a permit and park on our neighborhood streets. Back to square one. Analysis summary 2.19 states the project is consistent with the general plan, meets all applicable required objective site development standards. Yet on page 2.10, it states the project violates the following four general plan policies and explains those violations away for various reasons. It actually violates others as well. These policies were written for reasons of protecting neighborhoods. I was an alternate during the general plan process and it was a priority with many people who did participate and now those protections seem to be explained away. M.3 3, at the end of the paragraph states, None of the local slash residential streets appear to provide more direct or efficient access to and from the project site. This is very narrow minded. Just ask any neighbor. You'll get the streets they use and they do not use high and bay streets. Not saying them because I don't want to add to the traffic on those streets. New neighbors will quickly learn where to drive. I thank you for your time and listening. 
I ask you to vote for a pause on this project till many concerns are answered. That's not a no, that's a pause. A pause will help save everyone's time and money involved in this project, including the developer. Thank you. And I am representing as the appointed president, Westlake Neighbors Association. This is Deborah Elston. Thank you. All right, would the appellant like to add anything else on formally? In the remaining time, yeah, come on up. Mm -hmm. We're expecting you. Thank you for being here. I, uh, since my statement is uh, rather lengthy, um, and I'm going to be reading it because there's no way I could memorize it, um, I prepared a copy for each of you. If someone. So we've got about nine minutes left. I want to hear what you have to say, but just keep an um, eye on time, be please. seven. Okay, great. So we're good. Um, good evening. My name is Norman Tardif, and I'm here this evening on behalf of the Spring Tree Homeowners Association. The quarry referred to in the reports and plans for this development application is on our property on the east borderline of this development site. Um, we were unaware that this, that this development had been changed from its initial proposal in 2018 into this revised proposal until we recently received a notice in the mail informing us of this pending planning commission hearing uh, concerning it. So we have not had an opportunity to give any input. Um, we are gravely concerned about the safety of this four-story apartment complex approved by the planning department being situated in such close proximity to the edges of the tall cliffs in our former quarry site. Um, I believe these were referred to as um, significant slopes of something of that nature, but they're vertical cliffs. Um, the Spring Tree development is on the site of the former limestone quarry operations in this area of Santa Cruz. We have several areas of tall cliffs that pose hazards to construction of residential housing. The single family residences in our association that are on proximity to these cliffs have setbacks of no less than 100 feet from the cliff's edge, as any closer was deemed unsafe by the geologists for the project. The proposal for this high street development has now moved the building site to the east near the cliffs and increased the structure height to four stories. Yet it only has a 50 foot setback in the area near the tallest cliffs and even less of a setback in the lower area of the building. These are 50 to 70 foot cliffs. Um, these cliffs were created by decades of mining and blasting with dynamite right up until the early 1970s. The quarry area situated below the cliff is fenced off and has a locked gate due to the safety concerns in regards to falling rocks and slides in the area. No one representing the development or the planning department has contacted our association requesting access to these cliffs as part of assessing their stability. No photos of these cliffs are included in any of the reports or the development plans that I have seen, yet they form the entire east boundary line of the development site. I invite the members of this planning commission to come visit the quarry site in person and from ground level look up at these cliffs that are 50 to 70 feet tall before you decide to approve a four-story complex along their upper edge. Uh, it is a sobering perspective, quite different than looking at it from the building site. The little eight-foot redwood trees observed from the building site on the other side of the cyclone fence along the edge of the cliffs are in reality tops of 50-year-old redwood trees growing up from the quarry basin below. Imagine moving the apartment complex next to Bank of the West downtown across the street up onto the cliffs across from the town clock. We all know we need more new housing in Santa Cruz, but it also should be safe housing. The level of risk for this high density housing as currently proposed for this site by the developer is called into question here. The answer to those questions should come directly from the most qualified geologists. The preliminary 
geotechnical investigation dated March 2023 by Dees Associates contains numerous statements into regards to the dangers and risks of this development site that, as stated, need to be investigated in greater depth in a phase two geotechnical study. Such a study has been made a condition of the approval um, let me just get that. for this project as it should be. There is also a 2018 preliminary geological report as opposed to a geotechnical report by Zen Geology, who also recommends a more in-depth geological investigation in a phase two report. This has not been made a condition of approval for this project. We feel it is essential that a phase two geological study also be explicitly required as a condition of approval. This is generally required by the Santa Cruz County planning uh, for this type of construction in similar geologic environments. We understand that the soil engineers are working closely with geologists, but that does not negate the benefit of a separate geological report that the geologist has their seal and their signature on. The primary concern with this site is the limestone rock formation, known as karst, which is characterized by voids, fissures, caves, and sinkholes. These concerns require the expertise of a licensed geologist to do a full slope stability analysis, especially on the hazards associated with the adjacent cliffs. Going from native soils to the construction of a four-story building with heavy equipment and soil compactors will certainly be an added burden on these cliffs. The initial 2018 geologic investigation by Zen Geology was followed up by a March 10th 2023 letter of updated geologic feasibility from um, Eric Zinn, the, the geologist, um, now with Pacific Crest Engineering. That letter recommends retaining Pacific Crest Engineering for a phase two geologic evaluation and supervision of excavation. The UCSC has developed a protocol for assessing the hazards of building over a karst site that Eric Zinn is very familiar with. We feel that item number 41 of the final conditions of approval for this project required requiring a phase two geotechnical report study by the Dees Associates needs to be reworded to explicitly require that the additional surface exploration, subsurface exploration of the marble karst formations be done and approved by a licensed geologist familiar with the karst environments. The current preliminary geologic report for this project was done for the original design in 2018. Uh, that report needs to be updated due to the fact that the building envelopes have now been moved to an area in close proximity to the cliffs and the buildings are now four stories tall. A soils engineering report alone, which is what the geotechnical report is, um, is not adequate uh, due to the nature of the geologic rock formations of this site. A separate phase two geologic study and report by a qualified geologist is necessary in addition to a phase two soil study geotechnical report by Dees and Associates. This is a common practice for such geologic environments. In the absence of the assurances of this specific requirement, we will continue to oppose the development as being overly hazardous. If any of you would like to visit the quarry site and look up at the cliffs and see where these buildings will actually stand, um, you're welcome to contact me and I'll happily open the quarry area to you. And that goes for anybody from the city as well. And it amazes me that nobody has done that yet. Uh, thank you. Thank you, and, and on time, which I appreciate. So uh, I'd like to give the city a chance to respond or rebut any of those assertions. No, I think we'll need to just double check the, the recommendations of the reports. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll just double check and then, and then can report back. But nothing at this time. Yeah, you can go ahead and take public more after public comment. 
All right, so at this point, uh, we're going to open this meeting for public comment. I am excited to see all of you truly on all sides. I see a lot of familiar faces. I grew up in this neighborhood. I've seen the cliff and uh, the building and all this. So I want everyone to please remain focused on positive energy and productive conversation. We're all here to make our town uh, as good as possible. To have a civil discourse, we ask that you limit your questions to two minutes at a max. If other people have already said what you said, there's no need to come up and say it again. Um, that being said, feel free to express yourself. We're here to listen to everybody. And um, I've been doing this like 11 years. I've never, well, once I didn't change my mind during public testimony. So it's just amazing what people contribute, everybody who's here. Um, I did also hear, I think, a young person in the back. So if, if, if people are willing and families want to talk first and then head home to bed, that's fine with me too. My understanding of the agenda is the applicant was going to get an opportunity to present next before public comment. Is that changed? That's correct. Oh, um, I skipped you. So <laughs> Thanks for coming up. Yeah, so you heard from the appellant. Then it's the applicant's turn, then you take public testimony, and then after public testimony, there will be an opportunity for the appellants to rebut any comments made. And then you close the public hearing. All right, well, come on up. Sorry about that, everybody. I got the order wrong. Yeah, so I would like, so my name's Sibley Simon. Um, I'm a part of Workbench and the application team. Um, and for uh, the beginning, I would like to introduce uh, the pastor of Peace United Church because uh, I first met with a representative of the church in October of 2016. So this has been a long conversation and process to reach a vision and work toward this project. Um, but it's really the church that had the vision first to do this project. Um, so I think their motivation and context is important to start with. Good evening. My name is David Patti, and I'm the pastor of Peace United Church of Christ. Um, there are quite a few of us here uh, tonight who are not going to speak. Um, but uh, I did want you to see who they are, and so I'm going to ask the members and friends of Peace United Church of Christ, who are here to support this. Please. Yeah. Thank you. And so on their behalf, I want to offer a brief word about what this project means to us. Peace Village is a central feature of our vision for the future of our ministry. And Peace Village is much more than a housing development. Our church organized in downtown Santa Cruz in 1857, and 100 years later established a new campus at 900 High Street with a large and beautiful facilities dedicated in June of 1959, 64 years ago. From the beginning, it has been a part of the mission of Peace UCC to be a place for the wider community. We offer our campus and facilities as a place of generous welcome, a gathering place for creativity and common cause, a sanctuary for prayer and praise in the arts. Imagine many of you have been on our campus any number of times. And we are a place for healing and service and recovery for the marginalized and for those who've had a hard time finding a place. We hold a vision of our church as a beloved community of caring and sharing, where persons are respected and diversity is celebrated as the gift of a loving God. Peace Village is a part of that vision for the flourishing of our ministry on the High Street campus and beyond. This is not the scheme of a distant developer. 
This is the dream of a community. Quiet. It includes 40 new units of housing with a significant percentage, almost half, of income qualified and accessible housing. But it's most exciting as a vision of our future on High Street, where we are committed, a place that invites neighborliness, come what may, and nurtures community, a place to live and learn and play and grow with a church at the heart of it. I thank you for your attention. So with that, um, it has been uh, my work and the work of our team to try to work to find opportunities to create more affordable housing in our community, and especially to try to find ways to create affordable housing that's not uh, publicly funded, because there's the only problem with publicly funded affordable housing is there's not enough of it. So trying to find new ways to do that, and one of the ways that we've found is by partnering with churches like Peace United Church. It was the first church that we started working with. So we've I've really found um, that this is an ideal project for our mission as well. But one of those very reasons is on a topic that comes up a lot here, which is that we think a lot about transportation in particular. And it's our mission to build housing where people are driving to so that there can be less, specifically, you know, we put it in technical terms, VMT, but we all know to reach our climate goals in California, we have to be driving less in total. And we don't want to sprawl. We want to build infill. But where is that? Of course, in an even more dense sense, that's going to be downtown. But this is also, we immediately saw the opportunity to build housing next to the county's biggest employer, which is UCSC. And so um, we're, we're immediately interested because the very reason there's a lot of traffic at certain times going there is because it's a place a lot of people are driving to. So there's, uh, it's an opportunity to have housing in that location so some of those people are driving to fewer places. Secondly, um, we're interested then in how we do it and we think a lot about this and we've had years to work on this project and there will be years more um, to help people live with fewer cars there. So that is why there's an emphasis on, and it's not just a lot of bike parking, but there will be other features around that as well. It's why we've been talking to Santa Cruz Metro and really excited that their plan to increase the headway on High Street to 15 minutes, more frequent bus service, and they're analyzing even whether they can make riding the bus free for everyone. Um, and uh, while we're excited, the city's brought back the uh, shared e-bikes and note that the station that's uh, less than a block away from this property is getting a lot of use. Um, so, and we'd like there to be more there because it's really getting used. But, uh, and, and we also are committed to providing uh, one or more shared vehicles with the shared vehicle program. So, and a lot of us on our team live this way. It's not just aspirational. Um, we have multiple members of our development team that don't own a car, that don't drive. Um, my family owns a car, and I use it about once a week because I go everywhere by bike. So it always uh, a little bit surprises me when people write in the appeal that people can't get groceries by bike, because I do very regularly. Um, last time I was at Costco, actually, with my bike trailer, I was not the only one. There were two people who were retired seniors who live on the Upper West Side who were at Costco by bicycle. I was excited to see that. Um, so it's something that's a strength in our community. It's growing. Now, that's not right for everyone, but that is also why we look at also how we manage this property. We're not developing and selling this. The church is not developing and selling it. We're both involved uh, permanently and for the long term. And so some of these units are going to have preferences for folks who don't own cars at the time they apply to live there. 
So that's a legal thing to do that you can verify with applicants. And so we're committed to making sure there's parking for church events. Um, I don't know that it was said explicitly tonight, but I know it's in your written materials that historically the church has rented a lot of parking spots to students. And the concept of this project from early on has been not to do that anymore, but to have that parking available for residents. So there has been excess uh, parking capacity relative to church use and events and the preschool use. And so now that can be the potential residential use. But our goal is that when this is measured after completion, there's a lot fewer than 26 trips per in a peak PM hour in this trip. And we're really trying to think of all the angles about how to bring that about. So I want to say that's that's something it's not just like, oh, we couldn't fit in parking, so we don't have much parking in this, or AB 2097, so we don't have to build parking. This is really like, this is a part of our mission, and we spend a lot of time on it. Also, because it was brought up, I want to say that um, absolutely correct that we that the um, geology in this location is a serious matter. And that is one of the things we got on first. It's some of the first money we spent on this project was doing those early stage investigations, both geology and geotech, and uh, getting the recommendations based on that for the setback from the cliffs. And we have actually, we don't have entitlement of, that, of this project yet. We're, um, you know, here seeking that approval from the city to get planning permit. But we've already started spending money on those next geotechnical studies so that were just mentioned. We know they're needed. We're really, I um, think it's one of the most critical things to make sure this building is gonna last a very long time and be safe. We completely agree with that concern. So we've already actually done the borings with the geologist um, on site during that for this next phase two geotechnical and geological study. We're bugging them to get the study back. We can't wait, <laughs> but the point is, Yes, that's a very serious uh, matter, and we've taken it seriously from the beginning. We're already doing uh, more of those studies before we're even ready to do any of the rest of the design of the building. And the way part of that, while we see it, we did the first studies to make sure a project can happen here. And we, we became confident of that. Okay, from a geological point of view, there's not big karst formations under here. A project can happen here. Now we're doing it to see what does the design of the foundation have to be or other little details on the project have to be to understand cost? Because cost, you know, it's so challenging today to build buildings with costs where they are that we feel like, oh, we got to get ahead of the game for the building permit application and understand the foundation, the costs. So we're already in that, in that um, geological and geotechnical uh, investigation. So that, that I wanted to uh, bring up. Um, so as far as um, other things, there were two other things I'll comment on that, that have been brought up in the appeal. I'm a little um, surprised on the density concern about the in, relative to the general plan and the base density allowed, because it seems like it would be acknowledged that if we weren't splitting the lot, if we were leaving it at 5.9 acres, that yes, this 40 units is less than the um, unit per 10,000 square feet base uh, density of the general plan. So that seems fine. But then because we're splitting the lot, then somehow that's just a big concern. So um, we've been just trying in good faith to say, yes, we want for a lot of other management reasons and stuff, we want to split the lot. We want to make sure that access is permanently recorded. We want to uh, make sure the density is handled relative to that. So there's no future concern. I think that was only 10 minutes, but 12 so far. But I had 20, right? Um, I believe it's 10. Uh, it was 20 for the... We didn't define it for you. Let's do 15. Does that sound like... Yeah, enough? only a couple more minutes. Right, but cool. I was saying ahead that it was 20 for, the other, that. for each side. Right, but anyway, the... the um, um, so, you know, and if we started now, we could under... We could use bonus density, right? We could use the density bonus that we're qualifying for. And so we could do the 40 units on the two-acre parcel, could walk you through how we do that, but we just think, I don't think this is a big issue, we just got to properly record it so that that density has clearly been used across the 5.9 acres. But um, so that was um, that topic. And then uh, briefly, I agree that uh, my best look at it is the, that I would expect in, in the Peace United Church 
it has a lot of say in how this is managed. It is a vision of having it as a community with connections to the events that go on there, to the church, to the school, et cetera. And so from the beginning, we've been talking for years about how this can be managed and, and to make sure that it's not overcrowded and to make sure that um, that is done well. And so we do target and anticipate, um, as I look at it, those policies are going to get us to a range of 100, maybe up to 110 people living there at any given time. But to be clear, the VMT analysis is about how long, how much driving does any given person who lives in that area do? And this is a lower VMT area than many parts of the county because this is a place people are driving to. So um, I just wanted to clarify some of those points that, that came up. Um, we'll leave it at that. We've got a long ways to go still on this project and more things to figure out, but we're excited at this point and we hope we can move forward. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, hold on, let me just uh, hear from staff real yeah, quick. Yeah, I, I wanted to respond quickly to. Patience, um, you can stay right there. Thank you. To, to Mr. Tardif's um, comments regarding the geological, I took a look at it. It does look like there was a recommendation for the geologist to be on site during construction activities. So um, just want to thank Mr. Tardif for bringing that to our attention. Um, so I think this could be resolved with an additional condition of approval, just reflecting that recommendation. Um, I expect the applicant would be amenable to that, um, considering that it sounds like they're, yeah, they're already, okay, great. So yeah, then, then we can just include that as a recommended condition. Could, could we just see it up on the screen for everybody here? And yeah, maybe if Tess can, can turn the screen up, I have it up. Thanks for your patience. Okay, thanks, just so everybody can see it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And the other added conditions of approval were number 45, 46, 47, and then the new one we have in front of us, correct? 56, I think? Yes, that's okay. correct. 44, 45, yeah, 46, 47, and 56. I'll, I'll make sure that the numbering all makes sense in the recommendation. Got it. Thank you. Hey, good evening. Uh, my name is Jeff Oberman. I am a resident taxpayer, um, actually within five doors of the property on High Street. Um, I appreciate the pastor. I appreciate everybody standing up. I'm going to do a little challenge here, though. How many people, please stand up if you currently have a child walking to Coastal Community Preschool or Westlake? Okay, we've got one. Just baby count. That's three. Good, good. Four. Okay, I am here for safety, and I have extreme concerns on the number that was related earlier this evening from the city that. There have only been 18 incidents and two accidents within the past 12 months. Um, I can relate, except for being out of commission with a hip replacement in the last two weeks. There are every single morning, there is a running of the red light at the Moore and High Street. And there was an incident three weeks ago where an e-bike was hit by a, a car exiting westbound onto High Street. I was a witness to that. Is, is a much higher number of incidents. I also agree with the appellant on the challenge of having a police officer stationed at both drop-off and pickup. Pickup times are 12, 2, and 4.30. It's very scattered. There has to be a safety analysis. And the VMT study, as far as I know, was not done during the school year. And I just can't. I know we have uh, traffic safety uh, representatives in the audience this evening, and I am okay with the mission of the church. I'm okay with those from inside the community and beyond the community that are here this evening and the challenge before in the planning commission. It just has to be done right. These are children. That speed limit is exceeded constantly, and we need additional measures on High Street as a part of this solution. That's my request. Thank you. My name is Ethan Miller. I'm actually a resident of Calcar Drive, which is right around the corner. And I wanted to address parking. Uh, in particular, uh, given the, the, what uh, the church representative just said and given what their purpose is, uh, I'm very shocked that the Planning Commission is planning to allow residents to get parking permits. There simply isn't enough on-street parking 
to supply uh, you know, parking for 100 vehicles, which almost certainly will happen. And given what they've said, they want not to have vehicles there. We don't want to have the extra vehicles filling the streets. Uh, it was mentioned that we don't complain about what happens at the churches. I can tell you that every Wednesday morning, and I know that this is High, that this is High Street Community Church, not, not Peace United, there is a Bible study group. And Calcar Drive is full of cars for the entire morning. I bring this up because the number of cars, because it's clear from the development, they don't care about parking. They say they don't need parking. Well, then let's take them up on it and please prevent the residents of these units from getting on-street parking permits. There isn't enough parking within three blocks to support that kind of thing. And I will also point out that it's a question of fairness. Uh, when our houses were built, we were required to have driveways garages for, I believe, three cars per unit, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, can you guys correct me? Is that is that number correct for single-family homes? I have no idea. <laughs> Only two? Is two or number, three. But the, the number but of my, my point is that we were required to do that, and now what you're asking the residents to do is to subsidize parking for the residents of a place that is not parking on street, yes, you are, to subsidize parking for people for whom they've decided they don't need to pay for the parking themselves. So what I'm saying is they've decided that it's not a big issue for them not to have cars, and I'm simply saying we should take them up on it. If you don't, you will have a problem on the nearby streets as the residents will all be driving cars. I don't care what they say. It's going to happen. So I would urge you to restrict parking permits for the residents. Could everyone please line up on that side? Thanks. Good evening, Chair Kennedy and members of the commission. My name is Ken Thomas. I'm a member of Peace United Church of Christ located at 900 High Street where the project is located. I'm also a COPA leader. COPA is an organization that was founded in 2003. It's, non, it's a nonprofit, a nonpartisan organization. It stands for Communities Organized for Relational Power and Action. Uh, we've organized various institutions in the Monterey Bay area, Monterey County, San Benito, and Santa Cruz County. I think our membership now is 30 institutions. Uh, it includes labor associations, schools, nonprofits, health clinics, and uh, faith communities. Um, I'm here to speak in favor of the project and hopefully denial of the appeal. Um, I uh, find, I, I think through the staff presentation that you found that the um, project is consistent with the zoning ordinance and the general plan. No environmental impacts were um, identified. Uh, it's consistent, or excuse me, it's, um, um, it's an infill project. It's located near a transit uh, stop plus a major corridor. Uh, it's nearby a major employer of the county, of the city, and um, it also furthers the goals and objectives of the housing element, that draft out element that you recommended the other uh, two weeks ago to the city council. Uh, and most importantly, it provides housing. And this has been a recurring story that I've heard in 20 years about the need for affordable housing. Uh, not only is it new housing, but it's affordable housing. I think that's the most important thing, and I urge your support for the project and denial of the appeal, and thank you for your patience. Yeah, and just to note, it's optional, but if you do want to leave your name, it really helps Tess uh, transcribe people's names correctly, for the record. Good evening, commissioners. My name's Lisa Hazing. I've been an active member at Peace UCC since the early 1980s. I've also lived on the west side that whole time. I'm currently the moderator of our church, which is a kind of a lay leader. Um, for the last like six years, <laughs> I've been involved in meetings where we've discussed this project. And we are so excited because it will bring a wider community to our campus. 
and it supports our social justice mission, which is a very important mission to us. It supports it by providing affordable housing for middle, low, and very low income earners, and is a great benefit to the Upper West Side neighborhood and city. We have used our almost six acre campus for many, many things. And when we finally decided to build, we realized it was the right thing to do. Please do approve our permit and please do deny the appeal. Thank you for approving this well-planned and well-prayed for project. Hi, my name is Sharon, and I have been the crossing guard at Westlake Elementary School for the past four years. Thank you for giving me a chance to speak tonight about the situation I see five days a week at the intersection of High Street and Moore. There are a lot of people coming in from three directions to get to and from the school, cars, scooters, bikes, skateboards, school buses, and a lot of pedestrians. All of this goes on during the middle of heavy morning and afternoon traffic in both directions. I am here, um, during my time at this intersection, I've seen all sorts of crazy driving resulting in daily near misses. For example, one time I was in the crosswalk and was passed by drivers on both sides of the street running the red light. Another time I was threatened by a guy in a car uh, for stopping him from driving through the crosswalk with people in it. Here's what I see every day. I see several red light runners, and I mean red, not yellow, I, <laughs> that even happens when I'm in the crosswalk. Almost no one follows the speed limit. I would say 35, 45 miles per hour in a 25 mile an hour school zone is a conservative estimate. In my informed observation, the heavier the traffic gets, the more aggressive and careless the drivers get. I think we've been very lucky to avoid injuries and fatalities. In conclusion, the danger created now by traffic is highly unacceptable, and we, if we add more pressure from an apartment complex next door without a real solution for fixing the traffic, we are just inviting tragedy. Thank you for hearing me. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Andrew Merriam. I'm a High Street resident. <clears throat> uh, it's my feeling that this otherwise laudable project is being shoehorned into the wrong location with uh, many fundamental but unrealistic expectations that are going to come to haunt us all um, if the project is allowed to continue uh, as it, in its current form. Since time is short, uh, I would like to focus on one example, which is uh, vehicle use and the, uh, the number of cars that this project will actually uh, introduce. <clears throat> In our appeal, we pointed out that uh, this project violates a provision of the city's general plan to, quote, encourage land use changes that reduce the need for automobiles. Apparently, the uh, developers hope to encourage that reduction in auto use providing, by providing just 20 spaces for about 150 tenants. In their response to the appeal, uh, staff defended this plan and suggested that, quote, those who are deterred by a lack of on-site parking will likely opt not to rent a unit at this apartment. Uh, the best thing I can say about that comment is that it's highly aspirational. I mean, who wouldn't want to uh, cut the ties to their car? But um, hold on, who is going to give up their vehicle to live here? This is not San Francisco. This is not one of the new developments in the, uh, the bright lights of downtown where uh, transit is, is uh, sparse, but uh, everything is in walking distance. <clears throat> this is the middle of nowhere, relatively, in suburbia, which is uh, one or two steep hills up from the necessary services that, uh, that the people will use. Our local market is uh, the 7-Eleven on Cardiff, which has a good beer selection, but um, have you bought eggs there recently? The closest thing we have to a restaurant is the uh, rolling hot dog rack at said 7-Eleven. Next door to the 7-Eleven, uh, staff has uh, helpfully highlighted a laundromat used also by the uh, tenants in the adjoining uh, apartments. I will skip down 
Yeah, if you want to finish your thoughts, that'd be great. Thank you. Oh, thank you, sir. Um, people are going to look. Uh, tenants are going to take one look at this situation and say, "We need, uh, we need our car." We're going to be adding a lot of new vehicles <clears throat> to an area that's already overloaded at least three times a day. Doesn't matter if it's internal combustion or electric engines. They will diffuse into the neighborhood streets for both for parking and to avoid the, the daily traffic jams. Please let's ditch the fiction that this will be a car-free apartment and revise the project and its anticipated uh, impacts accordingly. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hello, my name is Andrew Al. I attended Westlake Elementary School. My son currently attends Westlake Elementary School. We live on Estates Drive and my wife or I walk him to and from school each day. I'm also a member of the board of New Way Homes. Um, I urge you to please reject the appeal and approve the project. Um, I disagree with my neighbors respectfully, I think, and I love Sharon and what she does as a crossing guard for our school, but um, we have a wonderful neighborhood and I think we need to share it with more people. The, Biggest issues I think in our city are caused by a lack of housing, and we need to address that. And you know, respectfully to again to some of my neighbors, my family has one car for two adults and a child. Many of my neighbors have two adults and four cars. It's very possible to have one car, an e-bike, to walk, to take the bus, um, and it's very very possible. And I think can and will be done. So please. Um, Let's get some more housing built. Thank you. Good evening, steam commissioners, planning commissioners. My name is Elaine Johnson, and I'm the executive director of Housing Santa Cruz County. I am here to express my enthusiastic support for the Peace Village project, which is currently in consideration in front of us. I believe that the Peace Village project aligns with our community's needs and values particularly in addressing the pressing issue of housing affordability. The thoughtful planning and design of this project reflect a commitment to creating a vibrant, inclusive community that benefits both current and future residents. I applaud the efforts of the development team in working collaboratively with the community to address concerns. I firmly believe that approving the project will contribute significantly to our community's growth and resilience. By providing diverse housing options, this project not only meets the needs of residents, but also contributes to the overall economic and social vitality of this city. I respectfully urge the Planning Commission to support and approve the Peace Village project. This project represents a positive step forward in addressing our community's housing challenges and fostering a more inclusive thriving city for us all. Thank you. My name is Bill Lee. I live on Bradley Drive. I oppose the project. I support everything everybody has said in opposition to the project. Thank you very much. Oh, he barely gave me any time for preparation here. <laughs> um, my name is John Hall. I am a resident of the Upper West Side. I am a member of Peace Church. I want to thank uh, the city staff for all the work that they've done on this project. And I want to thank the members of the Planning Commission, the Zoning Administrator. It has been great to work with the city on this project. I'm part of the Housing Implementation Project team started working on this six and a half or seven years ago. It's been a long uh, effort. Uh, it's been a volunteer effort by everybody who's working on it at the church. I think that's important to recognize that we're not in here uh, for anything but what we believe in, in our faith, for the betterment of the community. Now, I don't think that um, you as a planning commission should take religion into account. Uh, in uh, making your decisions. You have the ordinances in front of you. But I do think that community institutions are important. And if you look at the community institutions that are part of the city of the Santa Cruz, and this congregation has been here since 1857, 
Churches are important parts of the community institutions for what we do. You look at what the Episcopal Church has down, done downtown, that's a very important thing. Nonprofits are important in developing affordable housing. And we as an institution, not just a religious institution, but an institution that I think is central to our community, uh, have stepped up. How many community institutions are there that can do this? I ask you. We're here, we're ready to do it, and uh, I want to just conclude by saying we're the first neighbors. We're the first neighbors of the people who are going to be part of living in Peace Village. We have every interest in making it safe. I had two daughters that went through Westlake Elementary School, uh, and they're now in college or beyond, uh, but safety is crucial. It's crucial to us as a congregation. It will be crucial to the people who live there. One final thought, I've talked to people at both the Coastal Community Preschool and Westlake staff and teachers. There are people in both of those places who would like to live in this development. I ask you to yeah. approve the project, reject the appeal. Thank you. Hi, my name is Susan Thistlethwaite, and I did, in fact, write Thistlethwaite down, because it's not that easy. <laughs> I am a new uh, resident. My husband and I moved here in June of this year of Santa Cruz, and we joined Peace United Church of Christ. I want to make a case for this benefiting the community economically. You stand in line and line and line and line, and when you finally get to the counter, the people say, oh, we'd hire more people, but there's nowhere for them to live. A woman down the street from us in our new neighborhood said, I'd love to have my adult children and the grandchildren live here, but there's nowhere for them to live. And there is obviously a generational divide in our communities. And finally, this is what decent communities do. They take care of our neighbors. And I agree with John very much. We're stepping up. We're trying to help. It's not everything, but it is the decent community that embraces innovative plans to get these people housed. Thank you. Hello. My name is George Au. I was born in Santa Cruz 80 years ago. I've lived on the west side for 48 years, and I love Santa Cruz. I am involved with lots of things in the community, and our biggest, the biggest thing that we should provide is housing. Peace Village is the perfect place, and this project is the perfect place project. For years and years, these types of projects have been turned down. And I feel that if for the past 50 years, a few of these would have been passed every, every year, then I think that uh, we wouldn't have the problem that we have. We might still have it, but we would have done what we could. And I think that we should do what we can now. Please support this project. Please pass it. Thank you. Hello, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Zenon Elliott Crow. I'm a third year at UC Santa Cruz and founder of the UCSC Student Housing Coalition. Um, I just wanted to come out here tonight in strong support of the project and urging you guys to please reject the appeal. I think. One thing that's really crucial is when we think about housing in Santa Cruz is that we often have a geographic inequity when it comes to where new housing is built, especially as it relates to having housing near campus where we know there are thousands of people that are daily working, going to school, et cetera, in this area. And so we've seen that a lot of the brunts of uh, building more housing, which we know is necessary to combat the housing crisis, has been located either in downtown or in other areas and typically located in low-income communities. And so I think when we think about uh, the Peace United Church project, it's a really important step towards showing that actually 
we should be equitably distributing our housing growth across the city. And we should be placing housing in places that are near job centers. I mean, UCSC is the you know, largest job center in this place. And so I, I, really, I really implore the commission to look at projects like this as rather than adding commuters to the roads, it's turning commuters into neighbors. Um, instead of having folks that are commuting in from miles and miles away. I mean, I knew a student, I actually, so I was on the housing search right now, and I was just in class looking up housing, and the person behind me was like, oh, you're on the housing search. I'm like, yeah, I'm looking for some stuff. And he's like, oh, man, I couldn't find housing for two quarters, so I commuted every single day from my parents' house in Foster City and then came to Santa Cruz. And this is just a random student that was in my class sitting behind me watching me do this. And I think about that story. That's the one that I know about because I'm talking to my friend in class. But there are thousands of students that are either literally homeless or commuting in ordained distances because they can't afford to live next to university because there's no housing next to the university. And so I think that when we talk about this project, we talk about projects like it that are building housing next to these centers, we are converting people that otherwise would be driving from in ordained distances away to then live in the communities that we thrive in. So I really encourage you guys to please support the project and reject the appeal. Thank you. Hi, Commissioners. My name is Nicholas Robles. I'm also on the behalf of the Student Housing Coalition, and I would like to support, I mean, reject the appeal. Sorry, I can't think. But um, um, I just want to speak on the behalf of the UCSC students and myself, also knowing that what I went through to try and find housing this year was really difficult. It was, it was really sad for me to know that the housing market over here was completely inaccessible for me. I couldn't find housing on the day that we were moving out of school when I was still on campus. And I had to leave and pick a really expensive option that was, to, even to, to me right now, it's still really expensive for me to try and pay for it. And so knowing that and knowing that it's going to get worse next year because UCSC is not um, allowing uh, sophomores to have confirmed housing anymore. It's, I just know that it's going to be worse, and so if we get more housing confirmed for students or for the Santa Cruz residents in general, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Hello, Commissioners. My name is Olivia Brebs, and I'm here uh, with UC Santa Cruz on behalf of the Student Housing Coalition. Um, and I just wanted to speak to you today as someone who's very aware of the what was already referred to as the generational gap between what's available to students, especially of the younger generation, versus what was afforded to people who came before us. And one of the most important things that I believe, believe in is being able to preserve these areas for incoming students and for future generations. And we're not going to be able to effectively do that if each time an appeal comes up, it means an entire project is rejected and the whole process starts over again for the people who are in dire need of housing now. And we'll, that need will only increase as the student housing crisis grows. So I really urge you to reject this appeal. Thank you. Hello, my name is Bella Snyder. I'm a student at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and I support this project and uh, urge you to reject the appeal because I see how a project like this would have impacted me as a student in these past three years. Um, I've worked hard to graduate two quarters early just so <laughs> I can leave and find a city that's affordable um, and so I don't have to pay insane um, rent prices. It also would have afforded me the opportunity to live near campus where I don't have to commute with my car every single day onto campus, which would have been <laughs> great for myself and my car mileage. Um, <clears throat> I also think it's important in order to address the um, inequities that I see on campus and how UC Santa Cruz is becoming this institution that can only support with dignity students who come from rich backgrounds and it doesn't have the opportunity for students who don't have parents who can help them pay 2000 a month for a, a shared room um, four miles away from campus. That's it. Hi, um, my name is Natalia Gray. Um, I'm a recent graduate from UC Santa Cruz. Um, I urge 
you to reject the appeal and support the the development of affordable housing because I as a student have struggled myself finding housing. So the first kind of problem I found with that is that the availability of housing in Santa Cruz is like really dismal. There's not enough for students. Um, and just for people who want to live in Santa Cruz, I'm seeing that now as someone who's had to find a different city to live in that's more affordable. I would have loved to stay. Like Santa Cruz is an amazing place and there's really just not a space for me here that I can afford or that I could find. So I think building affordable housing would not only help uh, the new generations of students coming into Santa Cruz, but also the existing residents be able to stay here and live and build families here. Hi, my name is Pat O'Brien, and I am a, a neighbor of uh, the church. Uh, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. Um, uh, just because you don't own a car does not mean you don't hire Lyft and Uber and get things delivered by Prime and FedEx. So there will still be traffic, thanks to online <laughs> access. Um, with regards to incidents on High Street, I've walked my children to and from Westlake and all sorts of events many times. I was the head of the soccer league here in the county, and um, I've witnessed lots of accidents, and police were never called. Bicyclists were hit, children were hit. If the cops aren't called, they're not documented, so you have no record. So statistically, you have to have a little <laughs> adjustment there. Uh, a lot of times insurance is exchanged and people drive off, so you have no record of that. And lastly, on your stipulations for construction traffic, High Street already prohibits trucks. It's rarely enforced, but it is prohibited. So you might strengthen language on your stipulation. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Rafa Sonnenfeld. I'm here on behalf of Santa Cruz EMB in strong support of the project, urging you to reject the appeal. Um, uh, Santa Cruz EMB uh, advocates for more housing at all levels of income in Santa Cruz, and uh, uh, we we help organize letters in support of this project that's before you this evening. It's just really heartening to see so many other folks in the community coming out tonight as well. Um, it's a little unusual for us to, to uh, uh, have a clear majority of in-person uh, uh, supporters in, in council chambers and just seeing so many uh, folks here from COPA, from Peace United and, and, and elsewhere in the community. It, it's, it's just uh, really, really satisfying to, to know that, that so many people care so deeply about, about this issue and came out tonight to support this project. Um, I hope that, that uh, uh, this sort of thing continues in the future. It's really important for folks to, to be um, uh, advocating for folks who can't be here because they can't afford to live here, can't afford to be away from their family. And um, so yeah, just uh, thank you for doing what you do and uh, happy to see this project move forward. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is uh, Phil Hodston. I live on the west side of Santa Cruz for the past 10 years, and I'm a member of Holy Cross uh, Catholic Church. I wanted to give you a, a concrete example of what the lack of community housing is doing to our community. And in my own family, I have a youngest daughter who's in her fourth year of medical school, and she had a four-week rotation as part of the fourth year down at the Watsonville Community Hospital. She commuted from my home on the west side, and we had a little spreadsheet discussion about hey, uh, wouldn't it be cool if you live in Santa Cruz close to your family? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? You're going to be a pediatrician. You're going to be a doctor. You're going to be making relatively good money. Wouldn't this be a wonderful thing? And she said, Dad, I'll be $300,000 in debt by the time I'm out. And as a resident, um, residency programs, which she uh, is eligible for March, she, Stanford is looking at her. They're interviewing her. She says, I'll make $65,000 a year. I won't be able to afford to live in Santa Cruz. And if, if, you, if you apply the student loans, I, I can't live there. Without low-cost housing, even aspiring doctors 
who are servicing our community and our children can't afford to live here. We have to think about what our community is all about as we move forward into the future. So I urge you to approve this project. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you for your time. My name is Ryan Meckel. I'm a young renter in the city of Santa Cruz, and it is not easy. I just want to talk briefly about how the housing crisis here has affected me as a UCSC student and now somebody who both lives and works in the city. Um, there's simply not enough options for people like me to continue living here. You heard it from some of the younger people speaking today, some of the students, that they are going to leave and they're trying to graduate early so they can leave Santa Cruz and not have to pay these exorbitant costs. We are losing amazing community members because housing is too expensive here. A project like this would give people like them and like me an opportunity to stay in the city, to contribute to the city, and to build a future here for myself and a future family. I don't really see that for myself right now, quite frankly. I hope you deny this appeal and move this project forward so that people like me can continue to live here and contribute to our community. Thank you. Hello, commissioners. I'm Ellen Fitzgerald Murtha. Thank you so much in advance for your serious consideration. I hope that you uh, reject the appeal and move forward on this project. I represent Santa Cruz Welcoming Network. We're an all-volunteer organization that assists recent refugees and asylum seekers uh, as they settle here and create a new life free from persecution and violence uh, from their country of origin. I myself work with a family from Ukraine. Um, it is uh, our job as volunteers to try and help them find housing, medical care, education, and work, as well as get connected to legal services so they can become citizens. And housing is the biggest problem. Um, and so you know that. It's not news. Um, we welcome additional housing, particularly in the neighborhoods. I love the idea of us being welcoming as a community and saying to this refugee family from Ukraine that I work with, Yes, we want you to be our new neighbors. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bodhi Shargell. I'm speaking uh, on behalf of myself as a renter here in Santa Cruz, a UCSC student and a young person, but also as a member of the Student Housing Coalition. Um, I am in strong support of this project and encourage you all to reject this appeal tonight. Um, and I'd love to focus on the um, transportation and traffic aspect of it because it seems to be a commonly held issue that people have with the project. And I'd, I'd love to reemphasize the idea that this, this project and the construction of affordable housing doesn't add to traffic. It, it helps with this problem. Um, I live in a two-person household, me and my girlfriend. Um, we, until very recently, were a one-car household. Uh, I had to buy my own car as well, rather than us sharing a car, because I can't bike to work, I can't take the bus to work, I work in Felton, right? So we need a second car so I can get to work. This project will turn people in similar situations to mine uh, into people who can take public transit or a bike to work. Um, I, in my recently purchased car uh, today, waited about 20 minutes to a half an hour in traffic on High Street, going down High Street, um, to get from the UCSC campus to where I live, a couple of blocks from here. Um, if we build a whole bunch of affordable housing around the UCSC campus, we'll have people who currently have to live in Live Oak or Soquel or Watsonville to afford a place to live, we'll allow them to live right here next to the UCSC campus. Um, and, and those people right now who are priced out of the city of Santa Cruz, those are the ones creating the traffic going from Santa Cruz to other parts of the county um, where they can afford a place to live. And so if we create the ability for people who work at UCSC and work in the city of Santa Cruz more broadly to live near where they work, that opens up a whole bunch of more opportunities for people to get to work and live their lives without a car, which is what will help with the traffic that we have to deal with. So I'm in strong support of this project. I hope you deny the appeal tonight, and uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Dagmar Dorotschko. I am a five-year resident of Santa Cruz. The previous speaker, I don't know if I find her in the audience, um, note about the Ukrainian 
Refugees deeply resonated with me due to my Ukrainian heritage. And I'm an immigrant to this country myself. So I fully support the ideas of affordable housing. To this, I have a question to the developer, Ghibli, if I may. I would like to know how many of these 40 units are truly affordable housing, if I may ask this question. Uh, no, uh, staff can answer no? but after okay. public comment. But I would like to know that because it is my understanding that only a certain number of the 40 units are affordable housing. I believe that we should focus on other much larger affordable housing projects to solve this incredible problem. And maybe this unit at High Street is not the place to focus so much on the affordable housing part, but on the overall impact to that part of the community. I am sure there are many other places in Santa Cruz <coughs> where affordable housing would be much better placed also at the university where they are planning to build, I fully applaud that, that uh, affordable housing for students is, is really needed. But this particular place impacts that community to a degree that is underplayed by the developer and by the uh, proponents of this project, especially in terms of traffic, uh, providing 20 parking spaces for a unit that can easily house about 100 people is a little ridiculous. Thank you. So I, I would uh, urge to pause the project. Hello, um, my name is Marcela Simonkova, and I live on a Kalka Drive, so close uh, to the church. Um, uh, here on behalf of myself and some of the families that are uh, in Westlake and uh, also um, this United Church Preschool. Um, my concern is I'm also an immigrant in the country, and um, um, I, you know, I totally understand the students, and I totally understand uh, we need uh, housing and we need to be open to diversity. Um, with this project, however, I mean, we, I have three children and we moved to the neighborhood to provide a safe uh, environment for our children that can you know, bike around and walk around to school and feel safe. And already uh, with the UCSC traffic, it's, it's been pretty hard, but adding additional 40 units, 85 bedrooms to the neighborhood uh, seems like a, like a stretch. So. Um, I do appreciate uh, the church, um, you know, um, attention, uh, intention to actually build more housing, and I do appreciate also what New Way Homes are trying to do. Uh, but I would really like to urge you to pause this project and figure out a way how to make it safer uh, and um, more appreciated by the neighborhood. Thank you so much. My name's Ken Rodkey. I'm a longtime resident of Santa Cruz County, and I oppose this project in its current state. I agree a pause is in order. Lower density would be good. Uh, the ingress and egress, I feel, is inadequate. I believe it'll be an overburdenment, whether it's bicycles or cars. And it has no, um, I, that I can see, has, in, has no emergency access. Um, Furthermore, I, I see the uh, drainage issues on High Street as being a real problem. And uh, having witnessed this, the, the um, Westlake Pond is a spring-fed pond, and, and drainage has been directed from high down through the pond, causing um, just complete devastation to much of the aquatic life. Um, I understand the project's drainage is going to head toward Neria Lagoon, and Westlake Pond outfall runs to Neary Lagoon. So I am just uh, fearful that this will increase the more problems for the lake. Thank you. Uh, thank you, commissioners. My name is Bernard Putz. I'm a five-year resident of the neighborhood. 
and it's been interesting. I've been listening to this. I, I tried to go through the 300 pages of documentation that was submitted. And it's fascinating just to see the back and forth and the conflicts. And I'm all for affordable housing. I think we need it. My son actually went to UCSC, and we definitely need that work. But I guess what struck me today was just the questions that came up for me. The, the geologic report, where it looks like maybe it wasn't done as thoroughly, because it is at a, and maybe it was. I, I'm not the expert on it. But it just raised the question for me of like, OK, what is the impact on those cliffs? We hear a lot of residents talking about the traffic. I don't know what the traffic is. I do know that forget pulling out on High Street. I mean, might as well go down the switchback on Highland or something, because certain times of day, that traffic is really bad. The kids, always see the kids going. We have those. There's a stop sign there on, on Highland as well. The number of people that run that stop sign when we walk our dogs is abhorrent. It's scary. So I would just urge the commission to pause it and actually look at some of this additional information, get the data that actually supports or denies this. I mean, I don't know when the traffic analysis was done, but was it done during the UCSC academic calendar? Yeah. So that has a huge impact when UCSC lets out and then you've got the cars coming up from Highland off the of schools. So again, it, it's just, I guess, is the data set complete? Is there really refutable data that says traffic, not a problem. We measured it during these three periods of the year because traffic patterns are very different throughout the year. And so again, I just ask you to, to pause, get that additional data. I can't say that I'm opposed to it or for it at this point because again, I, I think some of the data is missing. So thank you very much. Hello, commissioners. Uh, thank you for your time tonight. I'm up here simply to end this on a positive note. Um, this is a really important project. Um, it adds housing. And the last speaker was just asking, what do we know? What do we know? Well, what we know is we have a housing crisis. And what we know is we have a really good project that fits in with the mission of the church. It offers housing in an area that's low density. It's a great location for housing. It's close to a job. It's on the transit. It's really a fantastic opportunity to add, as one person said, to turn commuters into neighbors. So let's uh, move this forward. Let's deny the appeal. And thank you very much. One more, commissioners. I'm going last because I can't stand in line. Back troubles. My name is Jim Weller. I am um, one of the church leaders uh, who was first uh, engaged in envisioning and beginning the development of this project. I've been personally involved in it day in and day out for more than six years. Um, I'm not going to repeat many of the things that have already been said uh, about the care and, and consideration and professionalism that we've put into this project. I am going to point out a couple of things that seem to be persistent misunderstandings among some of our members, uh, neighbors. One of those is that on our church campus, we presently have 130 developed parking spaces. Um, we only need to use about 50 or 60 of them. In the past, we have rented 70 or so spots to UCSC students. When this project is built, instead of renting to UCSC students, we will rent to residents, the same parking spaces. The church is providing parking spaces for every resident who wants one. They'll be rented to residents on demand. There will be plenty of parking spaces for all of the cars that residents own in the project, and there will be no impact on parking demand in the neighborhood. That's one thing. Um, the other thing is that we have, we've gone to great lengths to think about and study the traffic pattern on High Street, especially at the High Street Moore intersection where the Westlake school children cross. 
our project will eliminate exiting traffic from our campus at the Moore Street High Street uh, intersection. So there will be no conflict between cars exiting our campus and pedestrians. All of our exiting will be on far a thousand, nearly a thousand feet, it went on a thousand feet, 500 feet away from Westlake Elementary School. So it's very clear that there will not be an increase in safety hazard to children crossing High Street. Um, our, I don't know whether any of the people who have complained about traffic are traffic engineers, but we have had professional traffic engineering studies done, uh, which show, according to established professional standards, that the additional impact of traffic exiting and entering from our project on High Street will be insignificant by City of Santa Cruz standards. Those are the points I want to make. And to close, I want to just say that in this lengthy process, we have worked every step of the way in accordance with our city's planning and building policies and regulations. Our experience of cooperation and support on the part of the city staff has been commendable. City staff have worked through our project plans with an enormous array of considerations. We're grateful for that. We're most gratified by the staff recommendation for approval. In particular, we thank our project planner, Brittany Whitehill, for her diligence, and we trust the Planning Commission will reaffirm approval of our project. May God speed our work. Thank you. All right, would anyone else like to come up and speak? I will then uh, close the public comment period and bring that in back to the commission for more discussion and action. Commissioner Dawson. Yeah, I'd like to put a motion on the table and then we can have discussion about it. So I'd like to move that we deny the appeal and uphold the zoning administrator acknowledgement of the environmental determination, approval of the minor land division, design permit, slope development permit, density bonus requests, and heritage tree uh, removal permit based on the findings listed below and the condition of the approvals listed in exhibit a of the staff report with the addition of condition 56 and the change in language for condition 44 so um, it's actually going to be with two new conditions it's okay. uh, 56 and 57 okay with two new conditions 56 and 57 so I'd like to put that motion on the floor and hopefully get a second and then we can go to discussion um, after that do we have a second? Yeah, I just want to make sure I heard that right, which I'm pretty sure I did. So we just turned the condition of approval number 44 and made that number 57, just for correct, just so we didn't for have simple a simple process, yeah, right? Okay, I was wondering issue. about the numbering yeah. too. That was yeah. going to start to bother me. So yeah. I'll second. <laughs> All right, more discussion. I just had a couple questions. Um, one of them is for the developer, um, and I just had a question around parking and the lower lot. Um, I just wondering if there's some sort of a plan for that because it seems like there's the 20 parking spaces up above and then there's the big lower lot. And I know that there's a lot of concerns in the neighborhood um, about parking overflow and things like this. And I'm just wondering uh, if any thoughts been given to that or anything you had to say. Yes, uh, please come on up. Yeah, we have um, a lot of thought about it and work with the church on that. And we want to make sure there's still um, parking in the upper lot for folks coming to church and events as well, in particular. So we anticipate the bulk of the parking for residents will be in the lower lot and designated spots for residents, many of them who get their own designated parking spot if they have a car that is their spot um, in the way that's done with students right now. And then there are some accessible parking spots, some drop-off spot, unloading spots, et cetera, that can be right at the residential building to facilitate making that easier that your parking spot's a little ways down the hill for your you know, general residential spot. 
So we're going to be continuing to fine tune that. But when we were laying out the project, we wanted to use some of the space and the fact we're widening the driveway for emergency vehicles and different things to add those parking spots. So it is a little confusing because we're at we're creating those 20 spots as a part of the development, but those are not the only spots for residents. And in fact, tentatively, we're looking at some of those spots being some of the best spots for events and church access, right? But as um, Mr. Weller was saying, you know, there's on the order of 60 spots that are going to be a discontinued use that we can prioritize for residents all over. And, uh, you know, I'll just say to the gentleman I think is not here anymore about parking in the neighborhood, I'm on the same page with him. I years ago went to Public Works and said, we're fine if people who live at this address are not eligible for the parking permits in the area. And they didn't have a way to make that happen, but for us in the future, you know, et cetera. Because we are providing more parking, as we said. You know, what I think he misunderstood the number of spots for residents as a part of that. We are providing more parking, and we're committed to keeping the need for parking low. So we, we don't want people parking up the neighborhood either. Great. Yeah, it's just with the church use. Uh, at night and during the day, there's just a lot going on in that space. And um, yeah, I, I was just curious about that. One thing that was alluded to, but not fully said, is that there is this longstanding agreement with Westlake Elementary because the church events dovetail really well with school use. So there is at pickup drop off times, or s staff can use a few spots, a limited number of spots on um, the Peace United Church campus. Uh, during school time, um, because that's not when hardly any events are going on. Sometimes there's meetings and stuff, but that's not when the big events and main events are happening. And conversely, like on Easter Sunday, when more people are coming to church, they can park in the Westlake Elementary School when the Westlake comes and opens the gate to campus to allow that. So that's a wonderful overflow for these peak event kind of stuff. Great. And then um, you should probably come back. I, We're not done with you. <laughs> sorry, Sibley. <laughs> um, I got corrected. Apparently, the pastor has a key to the parking lot next door. But yeah, anyway. I, you know, I, I think that um, if it's not anyone with the key, yeah, if it's not broke, don't yeah, don't exactly. mess with it. Yeah. And if you have community agreements going on and it's not a problem, then great. That's yeah. that's good enough for me. Um, second thing, and maybe I missed this in the conditions of approval, or maybe I missed it in the staff report, but I didn't see anything about on-site management of the yes. rental, rentals. We are legally required any ap new apartment building being created now in California that's 16 units or greater has to have an on-site manager's unit that someone lives in with certain responsibilities. So we will be having that There's <laughs> be a manager's unit, probably one of the two bedrooms uh, units uh, in this development. Um, but we'll also have, uh, you know, professional property management staff that are coming and handling other functions as well. Great. Awesome. Um, okay, I'll hold my questions there. I do have some comments, but um, we'll do that later. I'll let other commissioners ask questions. All right, Commissioner McKelvey. Um, I'd like to ask um, what the um, CI projects that were mentioned in that area um, in terms of traffic are. Yes, so, um, and, and Matt Starkey is here. He may be able to, to speak more aptly to those. Hi, good evening. Matt Starkey here, Transportation Manager, Public Works. Uh, the CIP projects in the area are focused on the Bay Corridor at this moment. Um, one of them on the list has been a longstanding um, intersection improvement project for Bay at High. And then we also have a corridor improvement along Bay uh, where we're working on improving a separated bike lane network from UCSC all the way down to um, West Cliff Drive. And do you feel that the Bay High Street <laughs> Capital Improvement Project that you're referring to is going to address all of the letters and the concerns that we've heard here tonight? Uh, that's kind of a complicated question because um, we don't have any concerns about the traffic um, coming to the site. It did not um, achieve the 50 trip threshold that raise any concerns for traffic analysis. Uh, what we are working on in the, the Bay Street corridor and at High Street is, um, I think fits really well in with the VMT framework that's being talked about, 
where we provide alternative transportation access to help reduce vehicles and that miles traveled analysis. So uh, I would say generally, yes, it does sort of support uh, the concerns here where we're trying to provide alternative modes for people in this area. And I, I know that is a complicated question, but there we've heard from people that are like living it every day versus a, you know, an analysis or a algorithm. <laughs> These are people that are living this every day. And so as community, you know, members and as people on the commission, we have to take that into consideration as a real lived experience for people. So, um, yeah, so I guess I'm trying to understand how the, you know, algorithm that we're evaluating this from is really addressing these people's lived experiences, so. Yeah, I think the, um, I actually would turn our attention away from the CIP for some of these concerns that were brought up. I think they more have to do with neighborhood traffic calming concerns, um, particularly speeding on High Street. Uh, we have uh, coming out this uh, December, we're going to have a call for projects for a neighborhood traffic calming program where um, residents can petition my department to provide traffic calming devices. We have a one-time budget of $75,000 and are going to be looking to install that around the city um, in the new year. So I think keep a lookout for um, press release on that and the neighborhood groups that are here would be really great candidates to apply for that. Just one more thing on that, just because it's such a big topic for this community. Um, is there is there an avenue for um, traffic calming analysis or problem solving to be a uh, part of conditions of approval in a project? So I would say because the project does not trigger, you know, there's an, an objective adopted threshold, this 50 p.m. peak hour. Um, if that were to be triggered at that point, the traffic impact study would be required and they would have needed to do that prior to, prior to getting to this state. Um, since it's below the adopted threshold, um, the, you know, the, the standard course of action is to require payment of the traffic impact fee. Understood. Um, I guess more specifically, my question would be, is there any legal repercussions if we were to discuss that as being an option, despite the fact that they didn't hit that 50 threshold? I, I would say it could be argued to be a violation of SB 330. Um, we really, you know, we need to adhere to the submittal requirements for projects that are on our submittal checklists um, and and we have no authority to sort of require items to be submitted that there's not an adopted requirement for I think if, if you were to, to have something in mind um, that would be acceptable public works and the applicant then that uh, legal standard uh, issue could be avoided you you recently saw that with the 1800 SoCal project mm -hmm. yeah like a specific amount or we want X number of speed bumps or whatever. Um, I, I would add, I would add on you know, one tool that we have, a new tool that we're going to have is the way we adopt speed limits in the city. The state law has changed um, where we can use lower speed limits in areas where there's denser residential development. And so I, I actually have to review our speed limits every seven years, and that's coming up pretty soon. And so I fully intend in our new application of these new speed law speed limit laws and standards that we're going to relook at some of these corridors like High Street that have a 30 mile per hour speed limit um, where that's really not a great um, great speed for that road given the uses that we have out there today. Uh, so there are there are opportunities coming to improve the conditions on High Street. They're not necessarily the responsibility of the developer per our standards that we have, but they're actually more my responsibility as the person in public works. Don't go anywhere. I think Commissioner Dawson, your question is answered. So I don't want to spend all night, but you know, I started as a planning commissioner under level of service, which I detest, and now we're in you know vehicle uh, vehicle miles traveled, which I love. But I feel like a lot of people get a lot of people I talk to around town get confused about what vehicle miles traveled 
is, and I see it as like this kind of big computer model of housing and jobs and not about this one project. Can you just like in two minutes kind of remind us all like how VMT works? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is like, a, you'd probably take like a master's degree class on this. Um, yeah, I think the simplest way to think about VMT is the two parts, the vehicles and the miles traveled. Um, and compare it maybe to me in this area to how UCSC was developed a long time ago um, in the level of service framework. So when we used to do development review for transportation, we only considered um, the amount of vehicle throughput that you could have. And so to solve your environmental challenges, then you could just build bigger roads, um, which then increases more traffic. Um, but what happens with the VMT framework is you change you change the way you're thinking about it. You're looking for ways that could reduce the vehicles. And so that's maybe putting a development next to a good transit service. Um, it's putting a development next to where someone can walk. Um, or you're looking at um, that distance part, uh, the miles traveled piece. So again, proximity is more important. So it creates this new, um, new more holistic way um, to look at transportation as an impact um, the reason VMT is a really great measure of that is because we know that it's uh, correlated with um, greenhouse gas emissions. We know that's correlated with um, crashes and accidents that people um, experience, so safety. Uh, so it's a much better metric to more holistically look at um, the way we travel and the impacts that it has on our environment. Okay, so it does a better job at, at uh, capturing modes of transit that are not driving a big car. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for going through that one more time. Any other questions for Matt? Uh, no, for me. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Please approach the dais. Um, is the project taking advantage of any of the parking reduction measures that are allowed? With complementary use and bicycle substitution and well, any of those? Um, yes. Um, so the most extraordinary you reduction in the requirement is the AB 2097 that's of new course. this year, right? So that nearly eliminates the parking requirement. Mm -hmm. You have electrical vehicle charging spaces and accessible spaces. Um, so, and in absence of that, we, were, we applied while we were deemed complete in January, that was in effect already. We applied before, well, that was passed, it hadn't gone into effect yet. And there were other tools, the bonus density reduction in, in parking requirement or um, the church housing parking bill. There's a specific bill about churches and housing and parking. And um, that allows a certain degree of sharing between church use and, and use. So we've been looking for years at that and, and taking advantage of that. But what really it is, is like, yeah, be, especially because of 2097, it means, oh, there's not some just average requirement that we have to meet. We were looking at the project and saying, what do we, what do we want to target as goal, but then what do we want to make sure to have available in case it's needed? Mm -hmm. And available in case it's needed, we said, well, the church is, to make this viable, the church needs to agree not to rent park spot, parking spots to students anymore, because there, that is, you know, um, 1.5 spots per right. unit mm -hmm. right there. Okay, that's a pool in case it's needed. And then, that's great, bank that. Then we're going to do everything we can to reduce the demand from this to well below that if possible. So that's been our approach. We, uh, yes, there's a tool, there, the state law that kind of took the requirement off the table, and then we were able to study, well, what do we, what's the range of what might be needed? Aspirational, where do we want to get to? And in case it's ne needed, how much do we need to have? There? So part of my question is, uh, in the pre-2097 uh, yeah. uh, world, aren't we already, it, it's 90, how many spaces? 90 something provided? Well, there's going to be 100, at least 117 on the two parcels in total. Right. But we, the preschool needs 12. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's the church use 
right? And and uh, there's a formula for that based on space in the church itself. Right. Um, and so, and then you can do some degree of sharing. So this is this is my point. Just okay. even if, <laughs> even if the current, uh, if if though if the new uh, the 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 laws you know kind of obviating any parking yes. hadn't been passed, wouldn't this be close to passing under the old regime anyway? We designed this without 2097 and believed we were complying with the state and local ordinances previous to January 1st of this year. Okay. Yes. Right. And so it is our belief as applicants, and we didn't change anything based on 2097 coming into place, that this was already meeting the requirements uh, then. So, and maybe this isn't your bailiwick, but um, similar in a similar vein, if the church was developing it, uh, developing this housing project on this on a single site and it wasn't uh, subdivided. I know that there's some limitations on the uses, but wouldn't the density, the allowable density be higher than what's being proposed here? Yes. Okay, so um, maybe this is a question for you. I know that the, the uh, I'm, I'm I'm bothered by the form of the building. I know this isn't design review, but um, it, are you thinking this is going to be a modular construction mode? Uh, no, no. It's it's, um, and look, here's the thing. We, the, just to something I want to say on that. We're going to keep working on the exterior look mm -hmm. a bit, right? Mm -hmm. We went for the form, mm -hmm. and it is quite challenging with slopes geotechnical, all that. So we went for a very simple form. Mm -hmm. um, um, we are, the rules for what we needed to submit for this project did not include a fi final palette for the look and oh, exterior. So we have not, we haven't even discussed with the architects yet that kind of, mm -hmm. some of those things that will affect the look. But because of the slopes in particular, it's not, I love modular, but the access to the site and the slopes and stuff does not, um, couldn't really do modular in this case. No, I was assuming that you were being limited by that. That's, I, I understand, that's why I I'm understand that. That's it's, why I'm uh, being clear that. I'm just, we're just seeing a lot of these projects come through and they are. Uh, Uninspired? Insert word. <laughs> uh, just, it, um, just lack of. Imagination, articulation, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, I'm, I don't know that there's, yeah, and I, and I understand that you're saying that you haven't figured out all the details and things, but in the language of the, the, uh, the uh, conditions of approval, it says that the building will not vary from what we're approving here, <laughs> and, you know, and it's, there are finishes in, in the drawings. No, yeah. those are sample finishes. We haven't really established finishes yet. I haven't, we haven't even talked with the design team really about it. They put standard examples in there, but our submission requirements did not include, didn't, that and, weren't and, and our ability to, to require yet. anything else is limited. Right. It's just that. We know. care about that. The church cares a lot about the aesthetics of it too. This is a, a site where it is a little hard to represent. Um, I actually think the design from where you're entering it and the church is a little better than it looks when you're just seeing the model of the building from a vantage point that no one will actually see hovering up in space. But, and there's a lot, of, and we're more interested in landscaping that also changed this to look a lot. There's a very significant number of trees that we need to plant under the requirements for just as one example. Yeah. So I think there's a lot we're gonna do that it's going to affect what looks on paper like a box. But we have a lot of work to do yet on that. And we don't feel that we can go through a lot of that design until we know that we're allowed to build it. I understand. Yeah. All right, more questions, more discussion. Uh, Commissioner Dawson. I just had a couple comments, so I don't think they're questions, so Sibley, you can say if you want. <laughs> <laughs> but they might turn into them. 
Um, so uh, I just wanted to thank the public um, for everybody coming out. And um, uh, I, I will say that most of the time I don't agree with my colleagues up here, but I do know that we all take our service very seriously and that we all read everything that came in, all 324 pages worth. Um, and so, and we listened to all the testimony. So I really, I know, I know that it takes everybody's time to do that. And so I want to really want to appreciate the, appreciate the community for coming out for that. Um, and I just wanted to make a couple general comments. Um, in the appellant's video, something really stood out to me that I did want to just make a, a comment about. And um, the appellant said that um, she called them uh, protections that were in the general plan um, that they've been explained away. But I, I just want to, again, emphasize that um, what are, are called protections um, in the general plan, they've been legislated away. And you'll hear from the planning staff and you'll hear from others that um, you, you've heard about these laws and, and, and we are bound by those laws. State laws is going to trump our municipal code and it's going to trump our general plan and it's going to continue to do that. So I just want to encourage the neighbors to um, continue to ask questions about them, but also just understand that those state laws that your state legislators that you elect, um, you know, th those, are, those are governing what we do at this municipal level in a way that has never happened in the past. And so that's just something important to keep in mind as a community. Um, it was, I, I really want to appreciate Commissioner Timmery for bringing up the traffic calming, and that's something I think that we all as community members should continue to advocate at the city council level to, we know that there are corridors that are, are you know, very dangerous, and with this in, intensification and densification, they're going to get more so. So I think we all should continue to try to advocate where we can for that traffic calming. Um, and I just want to appreciate the comments about putting housing where we need it. Um, you've heard from many folks tonight about uh, UCSC being the biggest employer, um, student enrollment numbers going up. I personally live on the east side, and we do need housing all over the city, but we need to all allocate it fairly. And this is a, a wonderful location for a project, and I just want to appreciate all the work, and again, appreciate everybody for coming out tonight. So thank you. I'd like to add on to that just because we all have our, our, our areas of expertise is that um, one of the things that, that are out of our control is um, that this project was done before the objective standards were in place within the city. And so as architects and designers, you know, sitting up here, we don't, there's not really much to say about it because we, because it just has to be what it is. So um, the the planning staff, you know, and zoning administration have have worked with this project for many years and worked with them through this. And we trust that you know if something um, is within their control and they need our assistance with that they come to us um, and we support them. But we do have very little in some of these projects that we can really participate in. So I think it's important that the community <laughs> knows that that, that 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 this is what we're dealing with. So. All right, Julie. Thanks. I wasn't actually expecting to have a chance to um, comment on this project. So um, I, um, because I didn't expect it to come to the Planning Commission but I am really, really happy to um, have a chance to congratulate the development team, to thank the church for its vision um, and commitment to the community. And it is so much work to get a project to the point where, it has, where it's a complete application. It costs a lot of money. There's so many studies done, and um, I, I also want to address the you know, real concerns of neighbors too. Um, who don't always, who, who haven't looked at a lot of projects and know that there's a lot of study to get to the point where you invest what you've had to invest to get it started, and that um, there's a lot more study that needs to happen through the development process. Um, but I want to thank you and congratulate you um, for getting it this far. I also want to thank staff. Um, I think you just did a really bang up job on a lot of really complicated facts. and. Um, 
and uh, clarifying uh, questions that I know continue to be hard to understand. Um, I also want to thank the community for coming out, um, you know, for being really engaged. A lot of people did a really deep dive um, and an attempt to, you know, understand. Because when you see the changes that are happening in our city, we've all been watching it. But when it's happening in your neighborhood, it does feel really differently. Um, but the uh, the city should um, and really has to approve this project. Um, there's there's not a way not to, um, and it's been referred to a little bit here. Um, and one of the things is about the site of this project. This is within the city limits. This is where growth is supposed to happen. You know, we have um, the best land use decision I think we ever made in this community um, was to uh, keep development within the city limits. But there's another reason that I'm struck by about why this is such a wonderful site, which is that it's available. And um, it is, um, a lot of people have said, there must be a better site, there must be a better site. No, there's not. It's really, really hard to find a site. And um, this site has a lot to say about it. My very favorite thing was to turn commuters into neighbors. Um, you know, as well as just the, the real thoughtfulness on, on um, addressing how the world is changing, the way we use cars is changing, the rules around them obviously are changing faster than we can even keep up with. But then the final thing is, um, you know, uh, this project really is doing its darndest to take a different approach to affordability. And I have a lot of respect for that. Um, to try to design thoughtfully and efficiently um, because it is so, as, as uh, Sibley said earlier, um, there's not enough subsidy, um, public subsidy available to meet our affordable housing needs. And one of the things that we can do is design our housing differently. And this project really does that in really, really thoughtfully. Um, and uh, let's see, I will be enthusiastically supporting this project and denying the appeal. I have one more thing. Do it. Oh, well, I, I wanted to talk about the parking thing just one last time, which is that it sounds like the developers are also really concerned about keeping the parking on their property. That's what I'm hearing. So would there be, I know that the city in, in you know, what we read is not interested in um, changing the rules of permit parking as they stand, but is there a world in which that can be made an exception so that everybody can have, like that permit parking can stay out of the neighborhoods since they're committed to keeping parking on their property? I think the, the easy way to address that question is just that this, site this address is not eligible for the residential parking permit program full stop they couldn't Thank you. they couldn't apply today they couldn't apply tomorrow it's not a concern okay. great and and it, uh it's a great shared parking situation this is the new reality like some people are there shopping in the morning some are going to church some are going to school you know it's a huge parking lot designed to 1958 right. let's drive our big ass cars down the freeway standards Mm -hmm. uh, Eric and Tiffany, can I ask you one question? This is not necessarily about this project, but are bike shares computer, uh, considered vehicle shares? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I don't know that okay. there's a, a vis -a -vis, specific... Vis-a-vis -vis the idea that you've got a high-quality transit line and or, yeah. and or a, 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 sh a car share within a certain distance, or a, a, yeah, a vehicle share. I know there's, there are... Um, exceptions for those projects that do require parking where you can substitute bike parking for automobile yes. parking but it really doesn't um, I was I was thinking you know in terms of sort of uh, other development scenarios where uh, parking is reduced by proximity of mm -hmm. shared vehicles so but a bike but the the bike the city bikes do not count in that no. regard okay <laughs> I'd be happy to address the car share. Um, we will be launching a um, 
essentially a permit program for car share vendors to come into the city and apply for spaces in the public right of way to, to provide a car share spot. Um, that's in the public right of way, but um, private developers could also apply for car share companies to have a car share on their private property as well and have their own agreements there. There's a couple zip cars like Easy Walk up into UCSA already, too. Mm -hmm. I'm here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I make a brief comment on behalf of the property owner? Sure. Um, as I said, I'm a member of Peace United Church of Christ, and <clears throat> Sibley Simon is our esteemed developer. He's a professional, uh, affordable housing developer. I'm not a professional developer. You could say I'm an accidental developer. Um, however, my profession, my profession has to do with real property litigation. And I've spent decades involved with real property development. And I want to make the point <clears throat> for everyone in this room that the reason why we've been able to achieve the level of affordability that we have in this project is that our church is contributing the land where the project is built and the parking that's required for the project residents. We're not gonna be paid a nickel upfront for that contribution. In addition, I and others haven't been paid a dime for six or seven years of professional support work. So we truly have um, a faith-based community-oriented project that is sincerely intended to meet the community needs. We, our church, has been a center of our community since long before any of our other neighbors arrived. We are the community. We're at the center of the community. We are neighbors, and we care about the well-being of our neighbors. Another point that has been made is that we uh, proactively engaged in conversations with our only immediate residential neighbors, the occupants of the Hager Court townhouses at UCSC, and we designed our project according to their concerns. It's specifically designed to meet their concerns for maintaining the open space between our project and them for maintaining their vistas of the bay over our buildings, for improving their vistas by remove, removing big eucalyptus trees, for reducing fire hazard, about which they're very concerned with regard to those same eucalyptus trees, and we will also be preserving their uh, pedestrian walkway through our property to and from High Street and improving it. It's now a, a goat trail. It will become an improved, uh, developed, lighted walkway. So it's gonna be a great benefit to the entire neighborhood. Okay. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Well, I, that's a really good segue to one of my comments. Uh, I wasn't expecting to think about religion so much tonight. I was raised Methodist and uh, I am not part of the Methodist church anymore, but I, just miss that community and love it and seeing you all out here makes me appreciate how much these communities do. When I thought about this site and I grew up in this neighborhood running around with my friends up the hill and uh, there is wealth and privilege in every direction from this site and I just, that's okay, that's where we live, that's this part of town. I include myself in that statement, I live on the west side, but it's so great to see a project actively fighting that. I mean, as stated by the, the project team, this is what decent communities do. This project supports our mission of social justice, like right on, right on. So I'm happy to feel positive about religion uh, today in my heart, so thank you. Um, like Julie, I was kind of sad this one was gonna sail through without any speechifying from us, but <laughs> gosh darn it, this is the template for an administrative approval project. There's no parking impact. These are not busy streets. They're not blocking anybody's view. They're not taking advantage of the many different strategies some developers could do to get bigger, wider, harder, you know, all these different things. So 
just acknowledging that like compared to most of our projects, I understand that's all driven by financial pressure, but it's really refreshing to see people not grabbing everything they possibly can in this setting. So I acknowledge and really appreciate that. Um, I just have two more things to say. Man, did I love seeing Andrew Au and his dad out here. Me and him are second generation Santa Cruzans. And you know how many of us are around here? Zero. Me and Andrew and Mike and you know maybe a couple others <laughs> that I don't know. But that's our problem is we can't keep good people in this town. It's impossible to raise your kids here. This project will help, hopefully, my kids get their kids you know, to stay here in Santa Cruz. So that's just wonderful. And particularly seeing him up here was, was just great. So yeah, the last thing I'd like to say is the neighbors, please stop appealing. Please stop suing. This project should be in the ground. We need housing. I hear you. I know you have concerns. There's, this is the kind of project where if you walk over and talk to them tomorrow, they'll probably take your concerns seriously and hear them. So just stop. You're just delaying things. I'm sorry to say that. I have known Deb Elston for years. I mean, I see a lot of other names of people I know who live in that neighborhood. But we cannot continue to kill apartments like this. It's ridiculous. I don't know where the nearest apartment to this site is. I didn't think of that earlier. But it's like condos and single family. Anyway, it's a, it's a long, long walk. Uh, so good to see some apartments being built. So finishing, like with my pride, with all of you commissioners that I disagree with sometimes and agree with sometimes in the community, like this is Santa Cruz. We are pro-housing. You know, when my dad sat up here on city council and his memorial service was at your church, thank you. It was wonderful. We had a lot of parking in the neighborhoods. But <laughs> if he was here, I don't know that he would could conceive of this sort of a pro-housing coalition in this town. So truly, d disagree, agree. Rock and let's do it. Let's approve this project and move on. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make a couple quick comments too. First, thank you to the development team and Peace United Church. This is a great project with uh, probably the most diverse or I'm sorry, diverse set of units for all the different circumstances in life that people may find themselves in. And as my colleague said, it is an exemplary administrative approval. It's an awesome project. And, um, you know, we may feel differently about form and uh, the look of it all, but at the end of the day, the function and what it will do as a service to this community is awesome. So thank you guys so much for putting so much time and effort into this. Thank you for the staff report as well. Whoever wrote it, I love your writing. I'm a teacher and I... I see a lot of writing come across my desk. I like your writing style. Just want to put that out there. Thank you. Um, secondly, yes, um, to our neighbors and just kind of along the lines of what our colleagues have said about um, the state essentially preempting a lot of the development decisions that come across our desk. Um, that is going to be the way things are going to go for the immediate foreseeable. And if you want an example of why, uh, this project took seven years just to get here and it hasn't even broken ground. That's a problem. Correct? So, um, basically the era of democratic control over planning processes has ended because of that problem and because of the appeal that we are looking at right here tonight. Okay, so that's another thing I just wanted to say really quick. Another last thing I wanted to say is that uh, projects like this infill development in high income areas next to job centers along transit corridors is exactly the type of building that we want and exactly the type of building that we need. Um, occasionally, I've had the pleasure of finding myself in Alaska, and great fishing, wonderful music, good people, but that's not the best part of it. The best part of it is Whittier, Alaska, and for those of you who have not been there, have not heard of it, the entire town lives in one 15-story building, and the reason for that is because they don't want to sprawl into the natural environment and create more environmental problems than there already exist in a place that is pretty heavily mined and pretty heavily fished, right? So this project is somewhere in between Whittier, Alaska, <laughs> and what my colleague affectionately called the hellscape of automobile capitalism. So um, I think projects like this are exactly the type of thing we need and exactly the place we need it. And um, again, no project is perfect, but I love this project. So thank you so much. Any other comments? Are we ready to vote? Roll call vote, please. Commissioner Conway? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Gordon? 
Aye. McKelvey? Aye. Paul Hamus? Aye. Kennedy? Aye. Thanks. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks for coming out. Uh, we just have a few more boring things on our agenda, so if you can. John Wesley would be proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, we have two quick boring items, so if everyone can just head toward the doors, we can finish off. Um, hey, we got one more item to do. Can you guys all just clear out, please? Yeah, we got to keep much, going. We got to finish it off. Thank you. <laughs> Should we call the police out? No. <laughs> All right, Eric, uh, just informational items, schedule look ahead, and everybody here. Sure. Please lower your voices. All right, everyone, please. Go. We need to finish. Our meeting is still on. Please leave. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> At least take the conversations out. Yeah, so a couple of, um, a couple of quick updates. Um, last June, I mentioned to you in one of these reports that the Graham Hill water treatment plant's um, going through a significant upgrade to that facility and that an EIR was going to be uh, coming out, and, and that will happen. The draft will be released on December 7th. We'll have a 60-day uh, public review period ending on February 5th. Um, that'll be available on the Water Department webpage. There'll be hard copies in the Water Department and at the main library. Um, you'll have a, a minor role in making a recommendation to council on, on some of the habitable portions of the, the project, the administrative Very building. It's, it's a use permit, um, but council's going to have the final say on that entitlement. Um, so that'll probably happen in the spring. Um, 1800 Soquel was heard by council on Tuesday and it was approved. They, had, they did add a couple of conditions that were um, related to uh, some traffic uh, circulation improvements that were agreed to by the applicant, such as extending the um, left turn lane on Hageman and widening the uh, access to the alley a little bit and things like that. Um, so and that was all the sidewalks got narrower. Sidewalks did, did get narrower. Did kill by my extra two trees or did they make it through? Um, I think I added two street trees. You know, <laughs> I have, That's right, I have to later. confess, I, I did not attend the meeting, That's and right, I, I showed right. up at the very end, so I didn't see when the When I hear, like, scene. sidewalks getting narrower, you know, they good, did, good for turn yeah. lanes, bad for everybody else using that street. And there, there were some enhanced bike lanes on Soquel, yeah. too. That's good. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, schedule, uh, December 21st, we have the CrossFit in Harvey West Park and then the downtown hotel. Uh, no meeting on January 4th because it's during the holiday closure. Uh, we do have one item for January 18th, which is the local hazard mitigation plan update from Tiffany Wise West. So that's on the horizon. I feel like that hotel's a big one and it's going to be a busy week. Is there any way to like send us some early? I know. I, mean, I know. Yeah, I, so I know. I can't be there, so I don't know if others are going to be with us. Okay. Yeah, we'll. We'll do what we can, but it's it's going to be a big report, so I'm okay. I'm expecting it'll probably be right at the deadline, but we'll right, do our right. best. If we can get it out earlier, we will. I volunteered. I asked for it. <laughs> That's all I have. Okay. Thanks, everybody. With that, I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you all. Thank you. Very good. Since out 2004, that hotel.